What's up my fellow poker enthusiasts, it's Renee aka The Wacko here and together with my co-host Adam Carmichael we present to you the Mechanics of Poker podcast. In this podcast we deconstruct high stakes poker players, figuring out what it is about them, how they think, what they do that makes them so successful with an extra focus on the obstacles they faced and the skills they had to develop to surpass them. Over the years, me and Adam have gained a lot of experience in both reaching high stakes poker ourselves and teaching other players to do the same. We have bundled all this knowledge together in our coaching program, The Mechanics of Poker, which is the most complete poker coaching product on the market. If you want to have a chance to work with me and Adam so you can get unstuck and make more progress in your poker career, go over to mechanicsofpoker.com to apply. But without further ado, let's learn from another high stakes player's journey in today's episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Mechanics of Poker podcast. Before we get started, I would like to give a big shout out to everyone who has decided to join the Mechanics of Poker coaching program when it opened. If you were not able to join, if you missed out, if you were not accepted, We will open again probably somewhere in January. So stay on the lookout and maybe you get a chance to work with me and Adam then. All right. In today's podcast, we will be switching to four cards instead of two as we will have a chat with high stakes PLO player Fernando Habegger, better known as Jay Nandes. Jay Nandes has a lot of experience playing and coaching poker at the highest level and has used poker to help become the best version of himself. Always eager to improve and curious to learn throughout his journey, he has acquired a lot of knowledge, which he likes to share as teaching is one of his core values. As always, I'm joined with my co-host, co-mechanics of poker coach, Mr. Mindset and Performance, Adam Carmichael. Adam, what are you most curious for our guest today? Yeah, I'm super excited for today's guest. I've been fortunate enough to speak with Fernando quite a lot over the last year. And I'm very impressed by his strategic thinking and big picture lens on life. So uh, really curious to know what we can get from Fernando in terms of giving players a different perspective to view poker, to view life and making better choices going forward. I think there's a real big strength to Fernando's, which I'm looking forward to exploring. All right, before we start, I would like to give a big shout out to our sponsor, GTO Wizard. We are proud to announce a technological breakthrough. Introducing GTO Wizard AI. This powerful technology can solve any custom poker spot in seconds to high accuracy. Unlike pre-sold solutions, this allows you to edit the solving parameters. That means you can modify the ranges, change the stack and pot sizes, customize the betting tree, and automatically simplify and optimize your bet sizes. Brace yourself, the meta is about to change. So sign up to GTO Wizard using the link below, gtowizard.com slash mechanics. Get 10% off your first month and join the weekly coaching webinars of which one every month is with me. Looking forward to educating you guys there. But without further ado, let's get into today's episode. Here he is, Fernando. Thank you for coming on the pod. Thank you for having me. Looking forward. Fernando, I know you mainly as a PLO player, coach. And I was wondering if PLO is the game you started playing when you started playing out poker. And I was also curious what attracted you to the game of poker in the first place. Yeah, so I, well, that's interesting. My career actually started in 2005, in 2005 or so, so moneymaker boom. So PLO was not really on the, on the radar back then. <clears throat> so I started playing no limit and fixed limit hold'em, sit and goes, et cetera, just like on the heydays of poker, basically. And the reason I transitioned to PLO is pretty straightforward. I just couldn't beat No Limit anymore in 2010 because it was solved. People listening to this in 2023, they're like, what? It was solved already? Well, not exactly. I was playing full ring No Limit Hold'em on full tilt poker before full tilt crashed. And I was playing No Limit 400, so two four blinds. And my strategy was... I mean, this is a little bit simplified, by, but not by much. But my strategy was basically, if you flop a set, you're going to stack top pair. It's going to work really consistently. And if you have top pair, don't get stacked by the set. That's basically what it came pretty down solid to. solid advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Especially for full ring poker. And it worked pretty well. So just a month before full tilt went down, 
I made 20 or 25K like three months consecutively on 2-4 playing just full ring Russian cash four tables with like a simple strategy. I mean, at that point, I was playing five years of poker. It wasn't like that simple, but comparatively to today, uh, it, was, it was relatively simple. I wasn't playing a profession at that point, but full tilt went down and then I had to move to stars. So apart from uh, not much of my bankroll, well, actually a lot of my bankroll got frozen up on full tilt because... I was just under the impression like this money just comes in forever. Like, this is amazing. Let's just spend all of it. So I had my case 20K on full tilt uh, and then full tilt basically crashed. So, I mean, they went bankrupt and they kept my money and it would take many, many years until stars would buy full tilt and pay me back the money to the point where it wasn't as important anymore. But my case money was locked down. So I had to move not only to stars and play six max, but also I had to get on this sort of staking agreement or something similar to that. It's, it's many years ago, but I remember vividly playing six max stars and thinking, well, it's no limit. It's the same thing. It's cash. It wasn't, it was very different. And I got crushed at two, four and three, six playing in some of the six max stars wrecks that I, that you never saw on full ring uh, on full tilt. And I just lost whatever money kind of I had left there. And I had to start rebuilding up at like much lower stakes. But at some point, I just came to the realization that maybe uh, No Limit Hold'em just like is too tough for me now, especially because No Limit had a component. And probably a lot of No Limit players don't realize that because they don't play any other games necessarily. But No Limit Hold'em has this very frequency-based approach, which means that it's very binary. Like you're either making a great play or you're making a terrible play. And it is very frequency based. So for example, how often you bluff or how often your opponent is going to bluff is, is completely based on frequencies. It's not based on equities. So knowing when to bluff and when not is a pretty tricky decision pre-solver. And, uh, and, uh, and what, like which hands to choose or which frequency it's, it is not, it wasn't conducive to like my skill set. So in 2010, a book released, which was called Pot Limit Omaha, Advanced Pot Limit Omaha Strategy and Fury and Strategy or Fury and Practice by Tom Chambers. And the book was priced at $2,500. And I decided that if I would buy this book, which probably no one does or not many people do, and I learn all the things of this book, then I would have a huge advantage over the other PLO players. And PLO was on the up and up. So maybe that was my time to start early with a game when I felt like in No Limit, I was kind of late in 2010, even though I did play No Limit since 2005. I, I, I wasn't a professional and I didn't, I guess, study as much or just wasn't as skilled at the game of frequencies as my opponents. So in 2010, I switched with the book. And in 2011, I became a professional poker player playing only Pot Limit Omaha, like PLO 100 and 200. And uh, yeah, and I, I guess that's how it unfolded. I'm uh, curious as a person who basically has, I, I could almost say never has played PLO a little bit here and there. You mentioned uh, it doesn't work with frequencies. H how does it work? You have more blocker information, on blocker information, therefore it's more driven by the actual hand you hold or? It's more equity based. So if you're on the flop in PLO, a lot of decisions, I mean, especially back then, pre-solver, are more so based on understanding how strong your hand is, which kind of sounds simple if you think about no limit. Like you got top hair and you have the best kicker. That's a great hand or a good hand. You have top hair, medium kicker. You have like two street value hand, one street value hand, et cetera. But in PLO, it's like, well, you got top hair and the third not flush draw and back to a flush draw, you know, like the SBR is four. And your opponent is betting half pot. How strong is your hand? It's like, well, that's a pretty complex question uh, to ask, but it's not based on frequencies. So by the time the money goes in the flop, it's not about is my opponent bluffing. It is how does my hand match up equity equity wise versus my opponent's stack off range? Mm. How is this draw basically that I'm holding matching up versus the stack off range of my opponent? So a lot more is equity driven. And that is... Those are questions that are easier to answer for me because you can use a tool. Again, this is all pre-solver and you can plug in some hands and be like, my hand probably has 43% equity and the SPR is two. So we need 40% equity to stack off. This seems like a profitable stack off. If I modify my opponent's range to 
This in these hands, it will be at 38. So against tight players, we might not be able to do it profitably. Where No Limit Hold'em is much more, I guess it's much more based on how often do I have to bluff this combo for a balanced range and how good is my blocker in this spot. And pre-solver, that was a very difficult question to answer. And the punishment was just incredible because if you're wrong, you're just dead and you just feel really stupid because you're like, this guy is never bluffing or this guy, it, it was just really hard to tell. And um, so I was, I was kind of fed up with that. And th yeah, I'm, uh, that's, why, that's why I basically switched. But I would say the main incentive, apart from equity versus frequency-driven games, was it was more unexplored. And I felt like my biggest asset, I mean, maybe, I'm not sure if that's still the case, but I guess back then my biggest asset was I had a lot of drive. So I was like, I have a lot of drive and ambition to work hard. It is just that in No Limit Hold'em, it gets paid off less given that these players have an advantage of many years on me. But in, no, in PLO, because it is new, if I work really hard now, then I'm going to get the payoff because I'm early and working hard or harder than my opponents, for example, buying this $2,500 book. So I have an advantage going into this to begin with. So that makes more sense to me. Have you used this approach as well when, for example, other games came out after you switched to PLO or maybe other variants of PLO? Have you applied the same when something new came out? You're like, hey, this is a new game. I should be on top of this right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, sometimes it bit me, sometimes it didn't. But I would say the, the, the main difference, the way I look at the po at poker in general as a career, I guess, to when I talk to people in coaching or just on a personal basis, is that I think of poker more as a marketplace. So poker is a marketplace, just like in business, where there are different vehicles and opportunities. And some of them are shiny and some of them are less and some of them are profitable and some of them are less. And the casino, for example, or the poker site, which is a casino, offers different products. So they offer sit and goes and MTTs and cash games, et cetera. And some of the products are really bad for you as a professional player. Like there are not beatable games or barely beatable games or the structure of the game is bad or the opponents are too good. There are many reasons why that specific product might not be great for you as a professional player. So you have to really understand the market and think what is a skill that I'm trying to acquire over many, many hours that is worthwhile and gets paid in the market well, not only now, but also down the road. And that's a very difficult decision to make, especially nowadays. Like back then, you can learn anything. You can learn sit and goes and entities and cash games and live and online and PLO and uh, heads up. Like all of it, it was all open because it was just a super great market. It was a soft market. Now the poker market is a lot more segregated and tough and, and, and poker players really have to be smart about what are opportunities right now that are worthwhile their time and also their potential because when you know whenever I listen to podcasts for example I listen to many of your episodes and I hear the question how did you get started I'm always thinking well it doesn't really like does that story is that story helpful for someone today and I think you can make it helpful by uh, contrasting what is the industry right now versus back then because a lot of people that give advice today they have learned most or they have most of their perspective build up back then so when you started playing poker in 2005 or 2010 like myself the market was very soft and your decision making process of why you would go into poker as a profession was very different than today so for example in 2005 you, didn't, you don't need to be a mental game master in order to make money playing poker. You don't need to have a high IQ in problem solving. You, you, you didn't need to be able to apply yourself to a profession day in, day out and be on top, on top level to make a full-time income. You didn't need to. Nowadays, you really need to, do, to have all these skills uh, accessible to you and, and, and perform every day. If you're that kind of person that is able to apply himself to such a high level to a complex game like poker, you could also make a lot of money in other areas of, of, of business, for example, and that are way less competitive, but the market conditions are much softer. So I think the incentives nowadays for getting into poker are definitely different. And the player group of people that is able to succeed and make, let's say, 200K a year is very different to back then. If you make $200,000 today playing poker, especially online, you have a very valuable skill set. And even more important, you have a high potential to earn, to, to be in a high earning position in different fields. And that's something that a lot of people probably don't realize when getting into poker these days. So this is 
under the assumption that when you get into poker, you see it as like an opportunity to make money, right? For example, let's say you have the skill set that you can make 200K online. You're basically saying that you should compare that to what other marketplaces, other than, for example, poker, would earn you for the same skill set, correct? Yeah, poker is a business opportunity just like any other. And of course, there are elements to that business opportunity, like your daily routine and processes and freedom that are attached to it that are unique to it. But also a lot of these are shared with other business vehicles and opportunities. And it's not only, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be outside of poker, it's even within poker. So for example, if someone starts playing poker today, uh, or not today, if someone considers making money with poker today and uh, making, making, it, making it their full-time income, dependent on their skill set and where they are currently located and opportunities in the market, they might be better off becoming a vlogger and playing live versus playing online and studying GTO. Like it might just make more sense, make more money, and it's more fun, very, very possible, than the other career path. But back then, obviously, in 2010, that was like completely irrelevant, like it wouldn't even exist. So it's a very making a very like the market is different to the point where the decision making framework is uh, is the same, but where you end up if you apply it correctly, it might be different. So if you look at the considerations, or so what what were the considerations you took when deciding to turn pro back then, and how would the consideration look different if you would have to start now? So back then in 2010, I was studying economics in uh, in, in a university in Switzerland where I'm born, and I was just making too much money playing poker uh, on the side. I mean, on the side, I was making, I was spending more time playing poker and studying poker than studying for economics, but I could have definitely succeeded in either, but both at the same time just really sucked. It just wasn't fun to do both things at the same time because I couldn't perform in either at a high level because it was just too much. So I had to make a decision and my decision was more so based on if I pursue poker, this is back 2010, I'm not going to quit my traditional path to make 100K a year. That was my mindset. Like, I'm not going to risk all of this and just become a poker player to make $100,000 a year down the road. That seems stupid because uh, if you make 100K now in poker, how much are you going to make in five or 10 years versus if you uh, apply yourself in business, how much are you going to make in five or 10 years? So basically, it has to compensate for the fact that you're taking a financial risk, but in, uh, and also a career risk by paying off disproportionately. Um, so back then, th I think that dream and that vision was definitely uh, very reasonable. There are people making billions of dollars in poker, playing, being sponsored, a mix of both. And it was... I mean, money was free, free flowing, basically left and right. So yeah, I think it was a reasonable decision to say, well, I, I'm, I can make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year for the next couple of years, for sure, in this thing, and then see where, where this takes me. Uh, and, and I think that was like my main, that con, con combined with the idea that if I work harder, I make more and I'm more successful. So it's on my own accord. And there's no boss that, that, that holds me back from earning more and making more out of myself. It was very appealing. But also something to consider is in 2010, becoming an entrepreneur, or you can say a solopreneur, where you have your own business, you just run a one-person company, it wasn't really a big thing in the online space or in the world in general. Like It wasn't as it is today, where anyone claims they're making, or they, they, they are a CEO, I'm a CEO of my own business. But anyway, back then, it wasn't a thing. So back then, online poker was like, wow, you can be your own boss working from home, through playing poker, which sounds amazing for people that can apply themselves, that have a good problem solving skills, and they do seek that kind of freedom. Nowadays, there are a lot of different career paths where you can do the exact same thing, where you're working for yourself. And the work, the harder and the smarter you work, the more you make, and the more freedom you have. Back then, it was it was not as viable or popular or even possible. So it was a very, from what I hear, it was a very calculated or rational decision based on the financial possibilities in poker and the freedom that you would get with it, right? Yeah, I think it's a, so it's a, it's a little bit of a mix. Uh, yes to that, but also I think I like the quote that, uh, I like this quote that says, um, man's biggest burden is unfulfilled potential. And I think when I went to economic, uh, uh, when I went to school and to study economics, this is the, that was the first time in my life I realized that I'm not as smart as I thought I was because there were people in my class that were just, 
destroying me in smartness and the way they apply themselves to school. So in my first year at university, I worked really hard and I reached uh, five out of six points you can say in Switzerland. So six is the best one, uh, the best grade. And I had like a five point something. And there were people in my class that had six and 5.9, 5.8, et cetera. And I was like, damn, these guys are just, they just are so much better than me in this thing. And when poker came around and or when I had more success in poker, I was like, you know, if I truly understand my skill set and I connect a couple of uh, unique roads together, then I can become the best at that crossroad of different skills and fulfill my potential. If I follow the traditional path of going to university, I'm not really great. Like I'm not a great performer given my my position or my skill set or what I'm what I'm born with, so, so to speak. Even if I work really hard, I'm not going to be one of the best. I'm going to be good, but I'm working really, really hard. So this doesn't seem to be conducive to, to fulfill my potential. But if I am working for myself within poker and I use all my skills correctly, I might just like come out on top and be also happier for it because I'm working within my talents more so than a pre-described pathway that I have to follow. Um, so I think that was also the appeal behind it. Yeah, it's interesting because, for example, if I think about how I started, I did not take any of this in consideration. <laughs> I was just like, hey, started to play poker. Game was fun. I like to play games. And, you know, throughout playing games, suddenly I started to make a lot of money. I was not thinking about, but in general, also throughout my career, maybe this was just true to my upbringing. And I think it's very true in the Netherlands. They, what do you really like? Right. Oh. They, they, they stimulate like your passions. And I was very creative. So I would, I went to like a graphic design school and I play games. I was never thinking about which job or which side is going to make me a lot of money. Maybe this was just in my environment, but from what it sounds like you were basically in economic class and you also saw your competition basically outperforming you, right? Like, Oh shit, I'm going to have to compete with those guys. They're apparently smarter than me. You also mentioned they apparently are born with something in a talents that make them better in economy. You also mentioned talent. What kind of qualities do you think that these guys in your class that outperformed you were born with or more talented with? And what kind of talents or things you should be born with in your opinion to excel in poker? I think just like raw IQ and just like understanding complex problems just faster and better. And, and I think that's, you know, if you have a, if you have an above average IQ, which I haven't tested, but I think I have like an above average IQ, but not by many points necessarily, it's hard to confess and be like, these guys are just smarter. Like their engine is just quicker in certain areas. But obviously nowadays, we also know there are different uh, types of IQs. There's emotional IQ and the way you apply yourself. And I met people that were ex incredibly smart in maths or problem solving skills, but they were pretty poor in life management decisions. So they couldn't really apply themselves in order to have either success in their profession or even in their personal lives, because in some ways their smartness was in their way. But if you take a very traditional path, like studying for a master's degree and taking on a management position where kind of people tell you what to do in order to be rewarded, some people with raw intelligence perform really well in that lane and they, and, and they get a lot out of it. For me, I think I, I, I perform better in, if you throw me a lot of, if you throw me a lot of um, problems from different, you can say, uh, if you throw me a lot of problems from different categories of, uh, how, what is the word that I'm looking for? If you, if you throw me problems from different crossroads uh, that require different skills, at me so like one of them could be a psychological problem another one is a business economical problem another one is like a product design problem or a marketing problem and and, and i'm trying to combine all these into like one solution that is kind of practical and comes out i think that is more so my skill set but it requires a lot of autonomy and it is more complex to identify how to make it useful that kind of skill set versus if you have raw output like if you are a superstar athlete in whatever sport that you're specializing in, it is pretty obvious what you have to do to take advantage of their talent. But for some people, their talent, you can say, is like more three-dimensional where you have to take a step back and look throughout many years at 
what's in your corner, like what your advantages are, look at it from different angles and be like, how can I make use of this in some ways that makes sense? And it's um, usually a little bit more of a painful process. And it was also for me, but at some point you start understanding I'm good at this. I'm good at that. I'm not good at this. And obviously I don't want to sound like someone with like limiting beliefs, but I think there's power behind understanding what you're good at and then thinking how that can be applied in the real world and making, um, making the most of it. And I would say that's kind of like what I was seeking for, going for a non-traditional path, going to poker. So basically, if I understood correctly, you are more in the camp of doubling down on your strength instead of like in improving your weaknesses. Basically, choose a field that your natural talents or strengths excel at. So basically, game, se game selection in life. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting topic because if you look at people like Goggins, uh, like David Goggins, and uh, the entire movement behind it, which I also, you know, follow and subscribe and find incredibly interesting, I think when you strive for a uh, difficulty in life, so you're trying to make it really hard on yourself and you're trying to work on your weaknesses, it's more a thing like an internal dialogue about pride and about confidence, like trying to develop confidence and self acceptance. And if you are, I would say, if you have worked through that at some point, maybe it's more about how can I make life easier for myself? And if you already accept yourself, that's a good starting point to make life easier on yourself. But also then beyond that, if you realize that, you know, not all roads are equally hard to travel, but they actually might end up at the same destination. So for example, in poker, you can play a format that is incredibly tough to beat and play against the best players day in, day out, where you need to be at the top of your game every single day and make it really, really hard on yourself. And you're doing that not for the output, right? You're not doing it in order to have the most external success. You're doing it for pride, for something internal to like build up your confidence, to find something within. But if you mature, I would say to a point where you're like, I don't necessarily need this anymore. What I'm looking for is I'm looking to take my skills and leverage them in a way where these skills allow me to have the best life quality that I, that I want to. Uh, I think then you're usually better off at that point in your life, it, especially if you can sprinkle in a couple of a couple of like uh, elements of discipline in your life where you're like, hey, I'm not like a, I'm not looking for the easiest way out in every single alley in life. But in general, I'm operating under under uh, a, under a smart approach that makes things easier for myself, and I'm not trying to make life extra hard on me just for the sake of it. That's a, I think I think very interesting, very good advice, and very interesting perspective. So, for poker players, what kind of qualities do you think help make poker an easier path to pursue than, for example, others? What makes uh, yeah, what kind of qualities should people reflect on if they have? That's an interesting question. I think that if we reverse the question and say what makes it very tough to succeed in poker, right? And I would say the most people that play poker, they come from a gaming perspective and they look at poker like a game, not like a business. And that in itself is that makes it harder. And that is because if you look at poker just as a game, then you don't look, you don't look at poker, the poker market in its entire, in its entirety as a business vehicle or, or opportunity, as a field of opportunities. You just look at the game and you think you need to acquire a certain skill to win at the game. And the harder you go and the longer you go, the closer you're going to get to acquiring the skill. However, you, don't, you might not consider as much, is the skill that I'm looking to acquire going to be worthwhile it, given the market conditions? Am I learning the right format? Am I, am I applying the skills in the right environment? Is this rake beatable? Am I getting cheated? Am I playing in the right environment? Could I move? Could I change the format? Like, what can I do in this market to succeed and make it easier on myself? Like, those things might not be of interest if you just trying to win the game. Um, and, I, and I see this a lot in poker and especially poker advice in, in terms of how should I build my bankroll? Well, just like deposit on the most obvious poker site that's available to you and then grind from low stakes for five years until you build a role. And hopefully by that point, you have the skills to beat mid stakes or something like that. And it's, it is exhausting and it's hard and it's not smart specifically. 
uh, but it makes sense in the context or, or through the lens of understanding poker purely as a game. It is like a, you know, in, in a video game, you just enroll into the, uh, you enroll into the uh, challenges ahead of you that are given to you. You're just like, well, this is how it goes. You just yeah, you, can, you cannot skip a level in a video game. Basically. Yeah, you don't change the game. You're like, no, this is the game. I, I can't beat the big guy at the end, so I just have to grind longer. That's, that's what I should do. But if you think of poker more as a business and a, an opportunity vehicle, you're like, well, what exactly is the poker market in the world? Everywhere, live, online, different formats, etc. What are my current skills and what are my network opportunities in order to seek out an edge? Because that's really what it is. Like you're trying to find an edge in the market, similar to a trader or someone in business. And you're trying to understand if I apply X input, what do I get out of it for it? Is it a lot? Is it not much? And also how difficult will it be? What is my success rate going to be? And a lot of the most obvious and easiest, like lowest resistant pathways to start in, like they have very high difficulty and low output and long durations where you have to apply yourself. And that's like not a great combination overall to get into it. And if you tap out of that for a moment and say, well, okay, let's just forget all the things that I have done in the last couple of years in poker. If I need to make $200,000 this year playing poker, what are five different ways of doing that that are completely different, like different pathways? And you start writing them down and then you add, apply to it also. Do I have currently the skill set to accomplish this? Well, with four of them, I don't. So let's just put them out of the window. One of them I do, or one of them I'm close. Maybe I, one I have already the skill set, another one I'm close. Uh, three other ones are incredibly difficult to attain the skill set within this one year in order to accomplish it. Okay, so that seems to suck. How many hours do we have to put in into each of the vehicles in order to make 200K? Well, this is this. What is the success possibility? And then if I accomplish it, can I replicate it next year? Like, will I uh, lose my mind doing it or will it be enjoyable or fun? So now suddenly you're, 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 you're developing vision over a map, the map of poker in the, like, as, as an ecosystem. And you start thinking more competitively about where should I apply my talent and skill and energy into that actually makes sense to me? And maybe the result that comes out might be an uncomfortable short-term truth. For example, hey, I got to move countries or I have to learn a new format or I have to hire a coach. It might be uncomfortable first, but if you're smart about it, you're like, yeah, but it does make sense. Like in 12 months, I'm going to be in a much better trajectory in my career in poker than I was before, but I need to switch things up. Yeah, it's kind of like also an sort of, so like an investment bias, right? Like, oh, I'm so invested in doing this. Then basically, if I now come to that conclusion, I have to admit to myself that what I did for the last two years, I was simply wrong. It's quite a quite a tough pill to swallow. Oh, yeah. I A year ago, for example, I, I became close friends with a couple of uh, younger poker players on Discord because we we're playing Counter-Strike a lot together. And they were playing 1-2 No Limit online on Stars. And... Uh, and, and the general mantra of one to no limit players and stars, it seems to me like is, you know, if you can beat this game, you can beat any game, like that kind of stuff. And, and this, uh, true, actually, yeah. <laughs> maybe it's true. Like, I don't yeah, know. So folks, if I can beat two of them, I'll zoom. Then afterwards I can do whatever I want. Yeah. It's like, well, what does that tell you when you beat it, then get the fuck out of it. So anyway, yeah, I told yeah, these, sure. <laughs> I told these guys like, wow, you're playing this like really hard game and like, you're making hardly any money. Like, how does this even make sense? Like this, like, where are you going? And then I, we we're just like thinking about it. And I was like, why, why don't we just go to the King's Casino and we just play some live poker? So we met up for the first time. They, they're from the UK. They flew to, they flew to Switzerland and we drove, drove to the King's Casino. And we played like for a one weekend. And these guys are pretty young, like mid-20s. And then uh, after the weekend, they're like, man, like what are all these guys doing here in the live table? Like they're just losing all this money, like thousands of dollars. And they're just like completely, they have like no ranges and no clue about anything. It's like, yeah, like, welcome to the soft market of poker. Like here, you can actually make money with your skills and you don't even need to be that much on point. So from that, we then said, okay, why don't we go to Vegas for the World Series? This was a year ago. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you guys in some of these games. And with your skill set and my finances, like this could be a good, uh, a good starting point. So we flew to Vegas and like now a year later, like, one of those two guys made like a huge amount of money playing live games in Vegas with the skill set that he has learned playing online, but then changing trajectories into 
into live poker in this case. And then, and then through that, like if you're in live poker to begin with, you also might also come across some people that are interesting. Maybe you get into an affiliate space, like you recommend people to poker clubs or you start uh, having more um, possibilities. Like maybe I'm going to create a vlog, become an ambassador. Maybe I'm going to learn about this guy that has a private game. Maybe I'm going to uh, learn from this guy that I'm playing against who's a business owner, how to run a business or something. So suddenly like new pathways open up because they're making some moves in the market of poker is the, is the way I would describe it. And it can really like pay off quite a bit. So a new opportunity show up when you go behind away from your PC. That's basically what you're saying. Yeah. That, uh, that, that's no surprise. Who, who would have thought that there. would be happening, right? <laughs> I, I wanted to highlight though that what you're describing, for example, I think you were mentioning the like the video game, you cannot pass the ambush. You're not talking about giving up, right? You're just trying to find no. a shortcut, like a door on the right to go around it and to, to basically position yourself in a in a in a yeah, in a smarter environment. Then I'm curious. I had this situation come up with uh, with an ex student of mine who I think that there are some crypto opportunities came up and but he was at the peak of his poker career right and comparing the EVs between the two crypto would make him a little bit more but we're talking about money that's already passed uh, passed I don't know exactly how much it was but we're talking about a couple hundred k in EV right if you then let's say for example crypto is a softer market and you can make twenty five percent more let's say it was 200k crypto uh, let's say poker was 200k crypto was 250k but you you hate crypto you you are way more passionate about poker then should you still choose crypto that's a that's a great question i think i'm myself like guilty of it's a thin line between prioritizing your so so to called passion versus making kind of rational decisions for business this is something that I learned running a business myself with other people. So when you run a business with other people, your passion overall like matters less and it's more about rational decisions. And once you understand that... Um, so I think the perspective that poker players have on the game is a little bit spoiled from the perspective that they think poker needs to give them all, everything. Like I need to be always passionate about the game and i need to love it i need to you know tap dance to the to my desk every day and nothing sucks and poker is also at the same time my favorite hobby and it makes so much money and everyone respects me because of poker i need i need all of these things in my job and it's like well maybe that's not going to happen you know and if you uh were to ignore some of those desires you might make even smarter decisions so i think it's a tricky and thin line. You don't want to make do something that you hate, but also you want to be smart. And the thing about poker that is different to, for example, investing or business is that the element of scale is not as present. Like you can scale your skills by going up in stakes, but you still have to work or you still have to play and you have to play well. And in business and investing, you can scale you can scale your money without necessarily adding more hours or complexity to the task, which is pretty appealing. In poker, if you want to make more money, you need much better skills. In investing, not necessarily. Like you can have the same skills, but just more leverage because you have more money and you can make a lot more money. And another leverage effect of business, for example, is that in business in general, as you become more successful and more skilled, it generally gets easier. So you hire people, for example, they do stuff for you. So that's easier. You learn things that allow you to work less and more efficiently. And I would say in poker, the longer you are in poker, there is a, you can almost say like a deflationary effect happening, which is that your skill becomes less valuable over time because the game becomes so much tougher. So it's actually kind of difficult to justify it's kind of difficult to see a super bright future in the sense that your skill set will be worth generally less down the road. And also um, the willingness of people to play for a lot of money might go down as well for several reasons we can discuss like online, for example, a lot, I mean, like 10 years ago, people played more online than nowadays, for example. So I would say from that, from that perspective, individual, from that, from that uh, individual's perspective, I would say, 
what is the skill set of getting into the crypto market in that example worth in five years versus the opportunity vehicle of going into putting that time into poker right now? Because, um, because that person probably is going to be active and alive in five years from now as well and probably wants to do something that, that is leveraging the time and respite now for the next five, 10, 20 years. So I think weighing these options is definitely uh, relevant as well, as well as you never really know what you're going to like uh, once you're good at it. Because, for example, running a business is really tough when you're a noob and it's really exhausting and it's not a lot of fun in many aspects because you're a noob. But when you're better at it, it becomes more fun because now you know what you're actually doing and you're not making huge blunders and you're not costing yourself massive amount of time for small tasks all the time. So I think a lot of things suck in the beginning, like going to the gym, but you shouldn't always judge your enjoyment factor based on your first hour in it. It can also become a lot more fun once you're skilled. Yeah, I, th I think I have I've read some studies showing that basically the more you progress in skill, then you actually start enjoying the certain task way more. Uh, it's not necessarily the task, it's more how good you are at the task in yeah. most cases. Um, it's, you know, if you look at people that are going to the gym, you know, like Adam and he's like lifting the 175 kgs on the on the half rep reps and squat and the squat rack and so on. People are like, how, like people that don't go to the gym and lift, they're like, how is this ever fun? This is no way this is fun. But if you go to the gym a lot, you're like, this is the most fun I have all week for whatever reason, because your brain chemistry or your neurons, I don't know, Adam probably knows better, but it's like, I know personal experience going to the gym and lifting hard weights is like, it's the highlight. It's amazing, you know, and some people could completely not relate. But it's, it's funny, actually, when you talk about the gym, let's say, for example, you haven't been to the gym and probably this still doesn't happen to you two guys, but uh, <laughs> let, let, let's say you didn't go to the gym for a week or two weeks and you come back. That first gym session really sucks. But if you've been going regularly and then like you're in a nice flow, you're you're upping up the weight, that's when it starts to feel good. So oh, yeah. I can I can I can strongly relate uh to this feeling. L listening to your story, I'm definitely more, I would say, a bit more of a gamer. At some point, I, I do do you recall that uh, I think it was Letter As who dropped the book, Treat Your Poker Like a Business? Yeah. It was probably in the same time, like 2012, something something along those lines. And that's actually I read that book and I was like, huh. So this is, this, is, this is how you can also look at it. But in the same time, I remember, maybe it's still up to true until today, but definitely less. But in the past, like the bum hunters, right? They were kind of looked, they were kind of being, being shamed in the corner. But I remember at some point, I think it was Elliot Rowe who said, well, maybe it's the bum hunters that try to talk shame on you so they can take all the money, right? They try, <laughs> they, they try to make everyone believe the bum hunting is bad, blah, blah, blah. So there was also some sort of conditioning, especially for me, uh, that I had to go over like, okay, may maybe game selecting a bit more is actually a good idea. Whereas in the past, I was kind of conditioned like, oh, shame on you. Uh, why, why would you leave this table, uh, you know, to find a better table? It there was also like some bad conditioning around, or at least talking from my personal experience. So if people listening maybe have the same idea, I definitely think a lot of the advice you gave will, will help them break through that. I was, I was curious when you decided to to pursue poker professionally, how did your environment react to that decision? So I was living in a student's apartment when I was studying in a one bedroom apartment. I mean, it was, uh, it was just one room with my bed and my desk. And there was like a shared kitchen for all the students. And I was living there during the week. And on the weekends, I would go home to my home city, which is an hour away to my parents. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they didn't really know that what they're paying for is basically me just studying PLO in the class of university. But uh, at some point, <laughs> it was like, okay, I need to, I was like, I'm going to quit this school thing. Uh, so I told them, I was like, you know, I'm, it, it was not a surprise to them because they obviously knew I'm like heavily involved in poker and all this kind of stuff. And, and I had my success with it. And they were not really against it. Like my father basically said, you know, if you want to be a professional poker player, that means you're self-sustaining and that means you need to like sustain yourself. So that's completely fine, but you have to like move out and do your own thing. And I'm like, yeah, of course, like I'm going to move out. Not, not a big problem. And then many years later, when I talked to him about that, he was like, you know, Fernando, I, he has two, three children. Uh, it's like, he was never lazy. He was never lazy. And I knew that, 
the decision to become a professional poker player was never out of laziness. It was it, it, like, he, he's going to figure it out. He, he did this because he wanted to achieve a lot of things. He wanted to do great things. So there was not a lot of worrisome of like, oh, he's going to drift into some weird thing that he's not going to get out of it. It was like, he's doing this because he wants to like find great success in some way or the other, he's going to do that. So they weren't really worried about that at all. And apart from that, in terms of environment, I mean, my personality of like, you can say, in some ways, I have kind of like a try hard personality. Like I had this personality, even when I was, you know, 18 or 20 or 23, when I became a professional poker player. So my environment was never like, oh my God, you're making this irresponsible decision. Like this is, what, what are you going to do? Like, this is bad or whatever. They are just like, yeah, this is just what he does. And like, he's going to figure it out. And I had a girlfriend back then and she was also studying with me and she would just continue studying and I was doing the poker thing, but there was never like the fear of you're going to mess it up in some sort of way around for them. For me, I mean, in the first couple of months, I was like, if I mess this up, it's going to be pretty embarrassing. <laughs> because, I think, I think yeah. every poker player has that because it doesn't sound to be true in your environment, but usually people are like me poker. So you feel always sort of a pressure, like, yeah, I, I cannot that the feel because then they were right about that this maybe not being the most smart decision. But did, did your parents then knew something about poker or they just had a very big belief in whatever you choose, you're probably smart enough to make the right choice? Did you uh, have think, like a sort of role model that you could say, hey, look, this is, you know, what people are doing? Uh, no, well, to, to this day, my parents don't really know the rules of poker that well, but <laughs> which is fine. I mean, in the beginning when I was more like, less developed i guess mature like mature uh i had more of a problem with that but now it's just like yeah i mean they don't really understand poker but they understand me and i think the way you sell poker to your environment if that's a problem is i wouldn't look at poker as the or your i wouldn't look at your environment as the problem necessarily or even poker it's more what they see in you right what you represent because they don't understand poker if you tell someone i play poker for a living they don't understand poker they are trying to make form an opinion and the, they have, they might have some biases because they heard about poker, but if your personality is so strong, they might just overwrite that and say, well, if you are playing poker for a living, there must be something to it because you're a serious person and you're driven and you're ambitious and you're professional. Like there's something more behind that apparently, because otherwise you wouldn't do it. So if you, if you um, project that personality and seriousness into your statements and into you, into your conversations about poker, they're going to respect poker and they're going to be like, oh, okay, I never understood poker. But now that you're explaining it to me, uh, this makes total sense. Like you're, you're like a trader, you're informed, you're making informed decisions on, on a high level, you're swinging, you know, lots of money back and forth. But at the end of the day, you have the edge. I completely understand. And then you, you just explain to them, like, what are the essential skills? Well, you need discipline and you need to be an, an autonomous worker. You need to make decisions for yourself, how you want to structure your career. You need to have bankroll management. You need to uh, be a, a solopreneur, basically, like an athlete. And every single day, you need to learn and apply yourself and make sure that you make the right decisions. It's a high, uh, it's a high stress job, but at the same time, you have a ton of responsibility. Like that's basically what poker is all about. And if you sell it like that, and they and and you have a certain seriousness behind it, they're like, ah, oh, okay, well, that sounds like a big deal. That sounds like a, that sounds impressive to me that you can do that. And suddenly they look at it completely differently. Yeah, it's it's not necessarily what you do; it's how you how you how you bring it across, right? You can say, "Yeah, well, you know, I I play poker for a living," or you can say, "Well, actually, yeah. I'm a professional poker player," and you know, bring it with some enthusiasm. Not only in poker, but let's say you have a different job that's um, maybe for the society maybe a bit shamed upon or looked down upon. Listen, it's just if this is what you want to do and you can convince it with passion and you and you and transmit it with passion that this is why you do it, then then that's gonna leave the impression on the other person. So yeah, definitely how you say it, it makes way bigger of a, way way more of a difference. Also down the road, like now that I'm uh, now that I'm more matured, I would say overall and I look back in a more reflective manner to to all these things. I would say someone that is just like younger in their twenties and they they want to get into poker and they're trying to convince their environment or even themselves. 
the number one advice I can give you is words are extremely powerful. So you never want to down talk poker or your profession or the seriousness behind it, even to yourself, because it really gets into your system. So oh, I just play poker, you know, like it's just the thing. Like never yeah, say then, anything then it becomes like that. Sort of, you, you also start to believe that you start to instill that mentality also in yourself. The more you repeat Absolutely. It. You're just projecting it into your own mind and you're just sabotaging yourself that way. I would just wake up and tell people like I play poker. It's like really high stress and responsibility, but I manage it well and I'm prepared for it. And I study every day because it is what I want to do. It's not easy, but I do enjoy it. And I do take on the challenge. So that's, I mean, I, I'm an athlete of my mind basically with my mind. I mean, Adam knows it poker athlete program. That's how you should talk about it. And if you do that every single day to yourself, to your environment, there's just like no denying in that this is uh, this is something to, to take serious. Yeah, if you say it with confidence, they will be confident in the fact that you say it with confidence and therefore will succeed so they don't have to worry so they can support you, basically. Yeah, and you, oftentimes with parents and parent pressure, it's also like one element of it is like they don't know how to tell their friends, right? Oh, your parents, for all the guys that are young, they also have friends, by the way. And they don't want to be, it's not only you as friends, like they have friends too. And they don't want to be embarrassed when their friend is asking them, well, now that you have raised your son for 18 years or 20 years or 20, but what, yeah. what is the great thing he's doing with his life? What did you instill in this, in this young soul? And then they're like, it's poker. He went broke. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's gambling at the casino and they're like, oh my God, what did you do? Where did How did go you wrong? raise him? Yeah, you know, I, I I can see that actually. I remember I, I talked about this with with my mother actually, and she actually says she always talks with pride about me against against her friends. But I don't know. I'm sure it wasn't always the case. Like obviously yeah. throughout your career, once your career career takes, you know, has a certain duration, and you achieve certain success. I guess they can say that. But especially in the beginning, I'm sure uh, among her friends, they were like, "Well, let's talk about Renee because I have some concerning. <laughs> he made some concerning life choices." <laughs> Absolutely, and it's I, hard to defend I, it. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't blame her. I don't blame her. Absolutely not. I mean, if 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 uh, you, you know your own child is like, I'm going to do this. Like nowadays, you know poker, but it would be something. You know, I'm going to be a TikTok dancer or whatever. And it's like, oh my god, what are you doing? Go to school. It's just, yeah, so that's actually, I, I, I thought about that, like because obviously, it's going to be something that we might not know now, as you already pointed out. But I think the best way, let's say, for example, my kid would come to me. I'm going to use poker as an example. I would probably I would probably do some research myself. Like, what is this poker thing? What are kind of the things we have to look out for? How can I support my child to make sure he succeeds? Because I'm sure in any any endeavor that he chooses, there are successful people. So I will try to support my child in a way that he or she will success in whatever endeavor they decide. Obviously, if it says this, I'm going to become the biggest drug dealer in the world. I'd be like, hey, hold hey, on, hold on. It's maybe, my Scarface. Maybe reconsider. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, as long as it's uh, legal, then uh, yeah, why not? Hi, guys. Renee, aka The Wacko here with a quick Mechanics of Poker 2.0 announcement. In our program, you will get access to 80 plus hours of content in which we will explain you all aspects needed in order to become a more successful poker player. Now, one of these, of course, is the technical aspect of the game in which I'll be explaining you all the mechanics behind poker strategies. We'll be talking about GTO, exploitive play with an extra focus on the why behind certain strategies and why the population has certain leaks. And to increase your win rate even further, we've recently added a river bluff and bluff catching section so you can increase your EV when those pots become very big. Our mindset and performance coach Adam Carmichael, he took care of the mental game and performance section of this program in which he will teach you everything you need to know in order to break through limiting beliefs, better handle your emotions, break free from tilt and play your A game more consistently. And last but not least, we've added the management and optimization section in the program in which we will give you various tips and tricks to make it more likely for your poker career to succeed and how to continuously improve as a poker player. Now, on top of that, this concept is continuously evolving based on feedback and suggestions we get from our community. Next to all this content, you will have access to our exclusive Discord community, monthly live Q&A calls, 
and one-on-one -on -one coaching session in which we are going to be reviewing if you have been implementing the stuff that we teach you in the mechanics of poker correctly. So do you think you have what it takes to master the mechanics of poker? Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com and maybe you will get a chance to work with me and Adam and make more progress in your poker career. But for now, without further ado, let's get back into more goodness in today's episode. Adam, when you considered to play poker, was it the same? Did, did you go through the same process as Fernando? I know you always play heads up, sit and goes. Did you scan the market and be like heads up, sit and goes? That's where the money is? Or was it a less of a yeah, thought out decision as Fernando did? Mm, yeah, it was very interesting listening to Fernando's perspective on how to approach poker like a business and almost treating poker like a marketplace. For me, I had two friends who had done a bit of scanning of the marketplace, so to speak, and they found heads up, sitting goes to be very lucrative through shock scope with all the rankings. So in some way it was selected because this avenue was lucrative, but it was very, very loose. There was no research, there was no real path. And as Fernando was chatting there, it really got me thinking about, let's look at two perspectives. One of business, like poker is a business and you're picking the marketplace. That's almost like the zoomed out lens of what games do I want to play? And then Renny, your approach and also probably my approach was once you've decided you've scanned the marketplace, so to speak, you've picked a game that you want to play, then you will play the game, which is the narrow lens, like the short term lens of what game do I want to play? And I found it very interesting how you were talking about kind of optimizing for the external pursuits. I wonder how players can also make sure the are also taking the box of the internal pursuits. I always think there's two games going on in life. We're trying to win our games that we're playing. So let's say a poker player is in poker somewhat recently. He's scanned the market, decided on the game he wants to play, and now he wants to go all in and optimize that game. He wants to achieve financial things, which are the external pursuits, but he also wants to feel fulfilled and become a better person in, in himself. For you, how do you balance those kind of two, maybe some of these conflicting goals of one, I want to move towards some outcomes, but also I want to feel fulfilled in myself and I feel like I'm in line with what I, what I want to do long term. Yeah, I think in we get a lot of messaging and signaling through social media about, you know, feeling good about ourselves and, and um, you know, you should be fit. I mean, you should be a lot of things these days, like you should be in shape and healthy and intelligent and travel the world, you know, like all the I mean, you can list 10 other attributes to it that you should all, all do. And I think that, uh, it's not a winning recipe, basically. Like you have to prioritize a couple of things. For me, I think for people with ambition, the best thing to optimize for first is do something that you're proud of more than prioritizing happiness. Happiness is very fluffy in many ways. Hard to describe what it is when it comes, when it goes, etc. But just ask yourself, if I look back at this, am I proud of myself doing this? Like, is this something I'm like, yeah, this is what I did. I'm proud of myself. I grew, I grew in the pursuit of doing this. It was worth my time. I put in the effort. I got the reward. I can tell this to my kids. This is something I'm proud of doing and optimize for that. Everyone needs in business, you have business principles that you operate under. You should also have like your own poker or business or life principles yourself that you prioritize. And if you list all these things like health and and, and, and wealth and connection networks and fulfillment and passion, and you put them all at the same level of importance, you're not optimizing for anything because priority means that you prioritize one thing, maybe two things. So I think at different stages in your career and your life, you should prioritize different things. But to begin with, if you want to achieve something like out of the gate, if you're a young 20 year old guy that hasn't achieved really anything financially, professionally, probably the first thing to aim for is how can I do something I'm proud of professionally and, and just optimize for that. And that will make sure that if there are periods and there will be periods where things are not fun and they don't make you happy, that that's okay under your new lens, which is I'm doing something I'm proud of. If you always optimize and ask yourself, well, but am I happy? Am I happy? You're going to have so many mental roadblocks to just do the thing you need to do right now and pull the trigger and just work because you're always asking yourself, well, I could do this now, but I'm not really happy with it. At the end of the day, you're just going to be some like really fluffy, weak person that is not proud of themselves because they were optimizing for the wrong thing. Now, if you are at a later stage in your career, let's say you already have achieved financial success and you're proud of yourself and you applied yourself 
at some point, you know, maybe you want to change perspective and you say like, well, now I want to optimize relationships. Now I want to optimize um, fulfillment or a different passion or giving back or bringing up others or whatever it could be, raising a family or feeling more love, feeling more connection to people or more happiness with myself or internal uh, spiritual findings, whatever it could be. But if you're trying to optimize for all things at the same time, you're not going to land anywhere, basically. So for young, ambitious people that haven't achieved anything so far that is most meaningful to them that they feel proud about, just optimize for, for, for being proud of yourself. I like that. And I was reflecting as you were speaking there on my own life and the things I'm most proud of sometimes overlap with happiness, but very often it's more in line with effort over time to get an outcome, which often inclines growth. I'm improving. I'm getting better at something. And often the day to day is actually not overly enjoyable, very mundane stuff, doing the same thing, repetitive, but I feel proud of being consistent with that over a long period of time. So yeah, I really like stemming towards what you'd be proud of rather happiness. Cause I think this is where a lot of people get lost, where they try to figure out this kind of what will make me happy every day. And they have periods of time where they're not happy, which is we all have, but yeah, I think the proud is a better one because it's more effort towards an outcome over time, which is really good. All right. So let's transition into when you've chosen to play the game of poker, you've selected your avenue and you're right. I'm playing poker professionally. Let's go to a, a challenging part in your career. So you mentioned to us 2013 in particular was a very challenging time where your bankroll went down to around 40K. So talk us through what was going on at that time and what were some of the challenges you were experiencing in that part of your career? Yeah, so 2011, January 2011, I started playing full time and I had only, not advisable, $50,000 bankroll. And uh, in Switzerland, that is, a, that's not a lot of money, especially today, but even back then it was not a lot of money. And I was living in my student's apartment, this one bedroom thing. I was basically, uh, I, was I was telling them I still go to uni so I can stay in the $700 one bedroom thing, which was also, I mean, it's pretty, it shows you how expensive Switzerland was back then even. So anyway, I was living there with these $10,000. I uh, bought 10 hours with Jared Tendler to learn how to become a professional for $2,500. And I bought the book for $2,500, the book that I mentioned before for PLO. So I was down to $10,000. And from 2011 to 2013, I was able to like grind it up in PLO, winning some tournaments and playing some live poker to maybe like 150,000 or something. And then I just like lost a bunch of that playing two high stakes cash games, like PLO cash games. And I dropped all the way back down to like 40 K or something. And I switched at 40 K net to war. If you can say I switched to uh, hyper sit and goes uh, 30 and $60 hyper sit and goes on stars, because I felt like they were more sustainable to like build my bankroll with less swings. And I also lost confidence in my PLO game overall. And in hindsight, like it might not have been, the smartest decision i think it would have been better for me to play live poker because live poker no limit back then you can control variance incredibly well like you don't have to bluff you don't have to do anything of high variance because people are just going to pay you off this is 2013 you can just control variance really really well and uh, but anyway that back then i moved then to sit and goes and yeah that was that was a pretty challenging uh, situation because i put so much of myself into the poker career from 2011 to 13 that I gained a lot of weight and I became really off balance. I was like overweight, didn't have many like social contacts. And I also, my, my, my poker career was, wasn't down on a downswing basically. And I had to switch formats, et cetera. And then to top it off my three-year relationship then, uh, well quit on me or like my, my, my girlfriend ended the relationship back then. And I was like, holy shit, this is like a, a storm, the perfect storm, which was a great challenge because I was like, you know what? I'm just going to turn this all around. I'm going to go to the gym now because I need to go and I'm going to like learn these sit and goes and so on. And then from, you can say from May or something of that year until September, I lost a lot of weight, get back in, get back in shape. I, became, I had a roommate in my apartment now so I can uh, lower the, the costs per month. I went to the gym. I grinded my roll up to maybe like 60, 70K and I was in a much better rhythm. And then at the, in September, after putting in all that work and effort and when, when going through the hardship of losing my ex-girlfriend back then, I won the Sunday million for $180,000. And I was like, this is like the perfect metaphor, you know, like this is a signal from, from, from the poker gods uh, to reward me for like the last three years of just like putting in all this sweat and, and effort into this career. 
And that allowed me to, for the first time in my poker career, to take a little bit of a step back and be like, okay, what do I actually want to do in poker? Um, let's go back to PLO cash and, and, and let's start approaching it again from a more balanced perspective, like losing the girlfriend and gaining the weight and, and, uh, and going downhill with my bankroll. It really like taught me a, you need to approach this entire poker situation from a much more balanced perspective of working not only hard on your career, but working hard on your relationships, working hard on your physicality, working hard on your routine. If all those things, uh, if, if you don't master basically all these elements, like you're going to crumble in this career. And I mean, from that point on moving forward, I was just like progressing in a positive direction, basically. Yeah, so there's two things I want to touch on. The first, which I found fascinating, was at the start of your career, you had about a 15K role, and you spent 5K on coaching and a book. So you spent 33% of your role right out the gates. So first of all, what gave you the kind of initiative to go with that and make think that was a good, like the best right move for you? Because I know a lot of people will be like, wow, there's zero chance I can use any of my bankroll right now. I'm, I'm super low. But you made two brave decisions to buy probably the most expensive book of all time and invest in yourself with coaching. <laughs> what made you think of doing that? <laughs> uh yeah so in my career i spent over a hundred thousand dollars in coaching and different in different kinds of coachings and for example adam and myself we worked together for a year now on uh, performance coaching you can say so i've been coached basically my whole life and i think the reason is because the the roi is like incredibly high on on getting coaching and if you don't think so it is just because you don't understand your own potential like basically getting coaching is not betting on the coach it is betting on yourself just as much betting on yourself to grow through listening to someone else and getting an other outside perspective that you value and gave authority to. If you can't give other people authority, you're just like delusional. You know, if you look at some people look at, I don't know, business talks on YouTube. Oh, this guy is a fraud. Yeah. But he has made like a hundred times more money than you, you know, like uh, what does it take for you to give someone authority over any space? Are you so ignorant to not realize that you can probably learn something here? So I think, People that just don't understand coaching, they're just not mal they didn't, they don't, they're not malleable themselves. They can't accept another form of authority. They can't give someone else uh, any, any sign of like authority or respect that they would then change their behavior based on outside perspective and advice. But if you are actually, you can say, enough humble in some ways uh, to actually respect someone else's opinion, then the ROI on coaching is incredibly high. It's like sick. Of course, Throughout my career, I had coaching I was more happy with and less happy with. That's just part of the business. But the, the, main, the, the main base point is still the same. Are you able to grow? Are you able to learn from someone else? If the answer is yes, the ROI is really high on coaching. The only reason why a misalignment could be in place is because some coach might be not the right coach for you at that point in your career. For example... Let's say there is a guy that plays PLO 50 or something, very low stakes PLO. And he come and he says, I need a PLO coach. Sure, I could coach the guy, but there would be a misalignment in what I need, as a, what I want as an hourly in order to be worthwhile my time at this point in my career and what this guy can afford and how much I can do for him at this point in his career. So he would be better to get a cheaper coach because... He needs, if he spends, let's say, $200 per hour on a coach, he needs to make that money back to have a positive ROI investment at the stakes that he's playing in that could work out. If he pays my hourly, like it probably wouldn't work out. So it doesn't make sense at this point. If you hire today Tony Robbins, it might not make sense to spend $100,000 on that or a million dollars, actually, I think it is, per year to get coaching from Tony Robbins because not because he sucks, it is because you don't have the kind of output financially to make it worthwhile to get that extra information. Like if you spend a million dollars, you're not going to make another $2 million because your business is not in that position right now. So you just have to find the right coach at the right time. So the, the, the investment does make sense, but I'm, I've always been like, I, don't, I haven't not only, I have not only spent a lot of money in one-on-one -on -one coaching, but also in mastermind and courses and, and seminars and like flying to people, et cetera, just to get advice, even talking about, uh, attorneys, lawyers, CPAs, like the, the best way, the easiest way to make friends sometimes is to actually first to buy the relationship. So the way you buy a relationship is you go to, you, to a, a very high 
uh, you go to a tax uh, attorney or you go to a tax advisor that is very high end, you, you buy their hours so they can advise you. And over time and over years, they probably will leave some nuggets about business and life and taxes in your conversations with it, the ones that are paid and the ones that are not paid. Like that's usually how you make connections and buy yourself into in different circles. And I have done this like many, many times in my life. And through that, I earned in, in, in the best advice that I could afford. That's also a good quote that I like is like pay for the advice for the best advice that you can afford. I like that. And I like the framing you use there of investing in coaching is investing in yourself more so than the coach. And I really like that because I think often when people take on coaching arrangements, they can sometimes outsource their success to the coach. When in reality, it's like, this is your life. The coach is going to guide you, but you're investing in yourself. This is you trying to get skills at a faster rate to help on your progression. So with this mindset, I'm really interested to know uh, when you realize this low point that the perfect storm, as you described it, everything's going against you. Uh, it really created a catalyst within you to change things around. I want to know how you start to change things around and how you notice changes in your career trajectory after that, after that moment. Yeah. So back then, 2013, I was still a young kid, a young and dumb kid. So, I mean, now I'm old. So when you hear me talk about back then, sometimes I'm talking about me now, it's just for the listener to realize, you know, like when Rene says, for example, Oh, you figured it all out when you, when you started playing poker, like I probably didn't, but in hindsight and more reflective manner, you know, like that's how I puzzle it together. So, when it comes to when it, when it comes to dealing with adversity, now me as a mid thirty year old that is emotionally more regulated, I would say the 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 biggest piece of advice is that your emotions don't have to guide your actions, and that's a very important distinction to make. So your emotions are all good and fine, and it's completely fine to feel demotivated or angry or sad or whatever it is. That's fine, but as the moment it starts guiding your behavior, that's the problem. So it's not about becoming a robot and just removing emotions altogether because you're going to suffer way more by doing that than, than, than by trying to control them. It is more about understanding that you can feel any way you want, but your actions are, diff are, are not connected to that oftentimes, which is called discipline, right? So, okay, I don't feel like doing this. Well, it doesn't matter. You don't have to feel like it doesn't have to be fun. It doesn't have to make you happy right now. Like all it, it doesn't have to do anything. You just have to do it basically. And I think, we, it depends a little bit on which cultural background you're born in, but the ability to just do something just for the sake of it is something that is true strength. And in, in, in a lot of today's culture, everything has to be second guessed. Do this. Why? I don't feel passionate about it. I don't want to do it. I don't need to do it. Well, yeah, but just do it. No, you can't. why? I don't have to do it. So why should I do it? So if you think back about different cultures, you know, for example, my, my girlfriend grew up in the Philippines and um, the, the cultural background is more like you need to be successful to survive. So let's find how to do that. Today, if you are lucky enough to be born in a different uh, environment, parents that are maybe more financially stable or successful, a, a country that offers more opportunities and more safety, especially when you fuck it up then you might not have that kind of mentality, which could weaken your ability to just do something because you need to do it. So I think these days, if you feel like, oh, I'm at, I'm at a low point, you know, well, principle number one, don't use the wrong, wrong language. You know, I'm at a low point. I mean, that sounds like it sucks. So obviously you don't want to tell yourself you're at a low point. Um, but you can say, this is like a real challenge. Oh, I'm going to take on a real challenge today because today I feel like, I feel like my energy is not at peak, at peak performance, but I'm going to perform at peak performance anyway. So this day is going to be a challenging day. It's a character forming day. Like you, you insert the language, first of all, in order to also rewire this misunderstanding of my emotions have to guide my behavior. So whatever situation you're in at the moment, just understand that focus on the most practical thing you can, which is the output, the action, the behavior. And you can hyper analyze your emotions afterwards or before that, how much, however long you want. But what really gets you paid, so to speak, what makes you, what allows you to make progress is the hyper practical actions you're going to take. And if anything is in your, in your, in your way of executing, you're going to suffer more long term. Because even if you, get, if you give in into your emotion of feeling depressed or not taking action, and you don't take action because of it guess what? You will feel more depressed the next day because you're even 
lazier that day than the day before because there's another day you just wasted another potential you just you, you just continue the story and the cycle of you being unproductive and in and in, 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 in being basically um imprisoned by your emotions you want to break that storyline and just do the freaking thing without having to hyper analyze your 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 emotions I love that. You mentioned your principles. I look forward to reading your life principles one day as a book, hopefully, or a audio. <laughs> and yeah, you mentioned it very interesting the way I was kind of thinking about this kind of analogy you're using with emotions. It's almost like a conflict between the action you want to take and the emotional state you're in. There's a mismatch. And very often we go with the, the mismatch of the emotion because that's generally dominant. It's like, I don't want to do this. It's aversive. And we take the path of least resistance. So I was wondering for yourself, like, how do we get so clear on the actions we should be taking? All right, because in order to not act on emotion, we need an element of will, which we could see as like exerting ourselves to overcome a certain kind of feeling to take a path. Now, if that path's very clear, let's say I need to do this to get this result, we can quickly use our will to overcome the kind of emotional state we're in. How do you uh, learn to uh, be very clear on the actions you're taking? Because I think a lot of people struggle with this because they generally end up in a situation and they're kind of going, I should do this, but it doesn't really matter. And they're kind of indecisive with the actions they should be taking. It's not like a clarity of the person I want to be will take this action. Then later they might act on the emotion in any situation and then regret that later. And I always think like often the, the challenge they have these people is they weren't clear enough with the actions that were going to lead to forward motion to, towards their goals. So uh, for you, how do you learn to uh, create enough of a direction that you're going in so that the action in the moment becomes more obvious and you can actually exert your will to to override emotions if that makes sense yeah absolutely i think the the biggest hurdle that we face as solopreneurs or poker players you can say is that you're just one engine you're like one entity basically it's all like your your private desires your personal desires and your business desires are all in the same system in the same brain and they're hard to prioritize at the right moment you realize how different that is when you start working with other people together so if you work in a business and you have an employee and you're like do this and they don't do it it's like incomprehensible it's like i don't care why you didn't do it like i don't well it wasn't in it wasn't on my passion plan today it wasn't i didn't do my mindset meditation in the morning so i, I don't care like you just do the thing that was what was the job is just do this thing right so what happens there is you create some distance between your own desires etc because you're telling because it's not about your desires you're telling someone else in your business to do something and you clarify on the task if you can do this for yourself you want to think of your own system like a uh, like a production it's basically like a machine or you know it's like the tesla factory where P, you know, have different you have different departments essentially and in the beginning in the morning you're kind of the ceo and you're trying to align your workers to do the thing that needs to be done and so you need to tell yourself like what is the thing i need to do for poker to succeed now your other brain you can say your emotional brain your creative soft excuse searching brain is going to try to romanticize and uh, persuade you to not do the thing by saying, oh, you don't need to do this thing. You're smarter than that. Or, you know, oh, you, you can do it different or tomorrow, or it hasn't, it doesn't need to be done necessarily because there's this other thing you need to prioritize right now. You need to call back this friend and whatever. So I think it is about understanding that the path to success is oftentimes very monotonous and just boring and obvious. And that's how, business and success works is to not be cute not trying to be out not trying to be smarter than you are and just understanding you know what poker is all about for example it's about solving a lot of puzzles so you need to become better at problem solving how do you do that well you need to look at problem solving machines like solvers like every day and you also need to understand your opponents and how they differ like how they play different than the solver so you need to analyze your opponents which is monotonous just open their hand histories click through take some notes open the hands you played, solve, 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 understand the solves, that's it. Now, you, that is the job that you would give someone if it is a business. You do one hour of this, one hour of that, and you take down notes. That is the job. Now, your other brain is trying to be cute about it. And now you have to do it like differently. You have to become creative. You have to change the task. You find excuses basically to make the whole thing more sexy, to, more sexy to you, basically. Trying to be cute. I think that's where the, where the pitfall is. And it is because your incentives are not aligned. 
Like you are the same person that is trying to run the business as the worker that is just executing on the lower level. And that's has to be extremely aligned in order to work out well. And oftentimes we're not because we're just one person. So I think looking at it from the outside perspective and saying, okay, look, I'm going to do this monotonous task for one hour, then the other monotonous task. And sometimes they will be exciting, less exciting, et cetera. But I'm just going to do this task for one hour, then this task for one hour. Then I'm going to grind for four hours. That is a job. Now, your private personal desires might be, your personal desires might be, yeah, but I also want to have fun. I also want to exercise. I also want to have connection. I also want to watch my TV show and so on. Sure. That kind of, that level of enjoyment is something that you have to, that you can, put someone else somewhere else outside of your workday, but don't look for it. It doesn't need to happen in your workday. And I think that's the problem of poker players to say like, well, if my workday wasn't as much fun as I wanted it to be, then I need to change my routine. I need to change the thing that is going to get me to success. No, you don't because some days are going to be just like they are and you're still going to do the thing. And if you want to have a little bit of fun, then do it at the end of the day after you have worked. But that separation between what your workplace should offer you versus what all the things you want to have in your life. I think that a lot of people lose that perspective. They think poker needs to tick all the boxes at every time, every day, and that's not going to happen. Yeah, I like the perspective as well as understand like you're a one-man business. When you're talking about business, I'm fully relating to a poker player. You are the business, you're the planner, you're the doer, you're the executor. And I think it's really important to realize that you're trying to get outcomes, no matter what you're doing. And there's a system that you can design that can get you to those outcomes. So the first thing you gotta do is design the system. You gotta step away from the kind of doing day to day and go, right, what system do I need in terms of my habits, routines, uh, patterns, skills to learn that gets me to that outcome. But then you've got the next job, you're an executor. You're also showing up to work. You're not just the planning guy and puts it in somebody else's work pile. You don't need to show up and execute. And now, as you mentioned, when you're trying to execute, very often emotions come up. These kind of short-term players of the, the mind trying to get us to take the path of least resistance and almost like the joker in the deck who's almost like whoa we'll, we'll, we'll take a so it easy here so uh, it's it's how it's learn both those skills to uh, design the system and then execute the system so um, let's say someone develops these skills they uh, are able to uh, use their willpower they're able to discipline themselves because the incentives are clear and also the intention is clear i think the intention is very important because often when i speak to poker players on one-on-one -on -one sessions and they stop doing something and almost always when i really dig deeper in it i'm going what was the intention like going into this behavior and very often the intentions drifted out of sight it's like oh, I wasn't really thinking about that at the moment. I just didn't really think, I thought I would be able to do that. And they lost track of the intention, which is the kind of driver behind the action. And then the, the behavior got sidetracked with emotions or other things in their day. So um, let's say someone's developed that skill. Cause I really feel for you, uh, you've developed so many skills that you kind of leverage for other things. So let's say you've been able to um, use your uh, kind of logic and reason to make forward motion. So to take the next action that moves towards your goals in spite of emotions pulling on you. What are some of the other skills poker players need to be learning, develop alongside it to make sure they're moving towards their poker goals and achieving the big objectives of winning the game of poker? I would really circle it back to, so let's say you usually like in business, you get paid for the, 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 the magnitude or the size of the problem you solve, right? And in poker, it's in some ways kind of similar because back in the days, I mean, there are other, there are other factors to play into it, like market, market conditions and so on. But back in the days, solving, prob solving poker problems or solving poker, you can say, without a solver is actually pretty difficult. But some people were really good at it and they got paid a lot of money to do that. So solving poker before a solver was out there was well paid and it was a highly sought out skill. Nowadays, solving poker is like, I mean, a monkey could do it because you just press the button on the software and it solves actually poker. That's like how technology has evolved right now. So you as a poker player, you start having to shift your, the skills that you're working on in order to differentiate yourself from the other monkeys, you can say. So everyone is like learning these sims, right? Everyone is opening GTO Wizard. Everyone is doing that. Sure, you need to do it as well, but that's not going to differentiate you from the next guy who's doing that, the next professional player is doing it. So sure, you need to, you need to understand the, the in and outs of the Sims and, and how your opponents are playing, but what's the differentiating factor? Like what can you solve for that they can't? And I would say it's understanding where the edges are in the market. So for example, last year I moved from Switzerland to Vegas. And what I've learned, the first thing I learned is that poker in America is great. 
online and life because people are pretty bad. They're not as educated as these freaking Europeans. Europeans are diehard people in poker. Like they just, they are good. They're good. And also the, the rate condition and environment in general is less conducive to making money. So if you have a certain skill set and you're good at it, ask yourself, what other skills have I not worked on that much that actually lead to much more output than the, the path I took so far? And for a lot of people, it means just like understanding the market, the environment they're in much, much better. There are a lot of games right now. There are a lot of games right now where either it's not worth your time because the rake is too high. It's not worth your time because the format is too fragile, like it's going to die out. It's not worthwhile because there's too much cheating collusion or it's not worthwhile because there's too much competition in it. That is like, I, I usually tell people like in, I don't know, coaching conversations are similar. There are many ways to fail at poker and only few to win. And it used to be different. You can just hop on any poker site and just win and just be like, if you have half a brain, you, you just win in some ways, like just make money. Now it's the opposite. So now you need to understand what are the traps in poker and what are the opportunities in poker? That's a true skill set to differentiate between those two. And the first point of reference is data. So why, why is data important? It, because if, if you understand data, you understand how many whales are playing on the tables you usually play at. What is the rake that you're paying? And what's the edge in between? Uh, you understand your edge a lot better in, in, in comparison to your opponents. If you understand how they play and in which spots they play different than you and why that is a mistake, you have data to prove that you have an edge in that game. A lot of players, they just play blindly. They really don't pay a lot of attention to data. Data means all their hands they have played, all the hands that they have stored about their opponents, about the environment, all the information they have available, the rake structures of the poker sites, the uh, shark scope. Like if you go to shark scope, you can see, for example, how many people have made a million dollars last year playing poker, 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 dollars that are tracked on shark scope and make that kind of money. Uh, how did they do it? What tournaments did they play? What is their schedule, buying level, ROI, history before? You can get data on all these, all these, um, well, data points basically, in order to be, have more informed decisions about where you want to put in your attention and effort. So the, the first skill set would be to understand how to interpret data and get your hand, a hold of it in order to find the differentiating factor be between what most people are doing in poker, which is just like learning strategy and applying it wherever is convenient versus really thinking it through and thinking what skill set makes sense to apply in which kind of environment moving, moving forward. The general gist, uh, the second skill set is, to, uh, the general gist of the second skill set is basically to understand that opportunity and difficulty are linked to each other. So you don't necessarily want to pursue something that is extremely difficult to do, right? So for example, in business, if you start your first business, should it be uh, launching rockets into the sky? Like, no, like maybe it could be profitable, but it, it is way too hard. It is way too hard. The effort, it's not worth the effort um, to do it. So maybe you should do something that is a little bit simpler. And in poker, there are many small elements of that, that that are true as well. For example, should you learn how to play 200 big blinds deep, 300 big blinds deep? Should you learn how to play heads up and six max? Uh, there's so like, should you learn multiple bet sizings on any given street? Should you learn X, Y, Z? Like you should ask yourself really like, what are you trying to specialize in? And is what is worthwhile my time in order to achieve my goal? And then pin it down and say, this is, this is where I'm going to exist within the poker realm and, and, and then nail that. And Oftentimes, if you're currently in an environment where it feels it's really, really tough to win, even though you're giving it your all, you're probably, like, you're probably not the problem. It is the environment you chose that is the problem to succeed. You want to be in an environment where it's like, I, I'm working hard, but this is, this is working really well. Like this is, this is going really well. Like I'm getting a lot of rewards for what I'm doing here. And, and I can see a future that is even better. Right. And that's hard to find, but it is a disproportional payoff versus just going into this is really hard, but I just need to work even harder. And then maybe one day it will become easy. No, it won't because you're in the wrong environment. Mm. Let's say if somebody has looked around the market and they decided that they're going to play a certain format, 
let's say they've got maybe stuck at mid stakes, 100 NL, 200 NL, and they're really passionate about making high stakes. They want to really move stakes, maybe get some pride in themselves, as I mentioned, walk towards that pride avenue of self-achievement, but it's really tough. And they're really, really grinding hard and they want to, uh, the pursuit is clear. I want to make high, make high stakes, but I'm currently stuck at mid stakes and it's a grind, it's a slog. And the only way kind of I can see out is to work harder and to perfect my skill sets. Would you recommend to that person, let's say they didn't mind the working hard, let's say they're young, 21, 22, they don't mind the kind of slog and the grind. Would you say that person should reflect on whether it's worth the effort of putting in the extra effort at this stage, or do you feel like this person should uh, double down on skills? And if he should double down on skills, what skills should this person be uh, trying to acquire? I'd say for most people, like they overvalue this idea of discipline and working hard as something that has a, they think at the end of the rainbow, they're going to have this amazing payoff and feeling of like, I am, you know, I worked really hard. You know, it's like the David Goggins analogy. It's like, okay, David Goggins works really hard every single day, but do you want to be David Goggins? Like, do you want to suffer every day for what exactly? Like for the pride you feel afterwards, if you had a child, do you want that child to be like Goggins or to be someone that is enduring suffering every day for character building traits? And I would say you need some suffering and hardness in life, but not to that degree. What I would wish for my child, and the reason I'm using the analogy of a child is because it's oftentimes the best way to think about giving advice to yourself, because you usually are kinder about thinking about your child than yourself. So if I think about my child, I would say, I want my child to obviously have discipline and, and, and work towards something worthwhile and so on. But I also want my child to have it in some ways better than me by being smarter about life decisions. And the way you're smarter is by sometimes thinking about what is, what, what is um, the path of, of, of least resistance, right? Like there, there is another quote by, I think, I'm not sure who said that, maybe it was Steve Jobs or something, but he said like, I want to have, lazy developers or something along those lines and the reason he said that is because he said if you have lazy workers they're going to find the fastest way to do something because they're lazy they're not going to be tryhards and trying the most complex most energy draining way to do something they're going to be thinking longer about what can how can i preserve as much energy as possible to get to my goal and oftentimes if you surround yourself by people that think more about how to shortcut things versus just work, 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 you end up in a much more, in a much bigger payoff and feeling better as well about it because you work less hard than other people, but your payoff is bigger because you leverage certain ideas. You look behind uh, what was the obvious one at the front. So I'd say that for most people, even if they think, oh, I'm priding myself in the fact that I'm working hard, I would, I would much more pride myself in taking chances and risks um, in order to have a disproportional payoff versus working hard. So what's the, what's the difference? Someone that takes risk in order to achieve their dreams, they might move a country. They might message a person like, hey, I saw you are playing 10 times as high as me. I want to be your prodigy. Where do I need to move? I'm going to play for you. I'm going to give you 50% of my winnings. I'm going to do whatever is necessary so I can make the money you make in two, three years. I'm going to take the risk to do that. Like that's someone that is taking risk for disproportional payoff. If you are grinding 16 hour days at home playing NL 100, that is someone that is just working hard, but is not really going to get anywhere. Basically it's just, it is, I mean, there's no element of leverage in that approach that is going to create the disproportional jump in, in, in that history, basically. So I wouldn't want that for anyone, basically, that is, uh, is looking for good success. Mm. Yeah, I think it's also culturally built into us to uh, kind of correlate hard work and effort with success and achieving things. Um, we're often sold on the dream that if we work harder, if the harder we work and we find a way to work as hard as possible, we'll finally get to the end of the rainbow and the pot of gold that we deserve. But as you've talked about, like there's much more strategic, better ways to think about calculated risk. I think the way you were describing it is much more like a calculated risk to a high payoff. So if someone's working really hard and the payoff is huge at the end of it, they could set themselves up for the future. It could be a massive uh, 
growth path in the end of it, then maybe the effort was worth it. But as you're describing it, very often people are just beating their heads against the wall uh, for not really much of an upside, and the effort is not really validated. So I say for those people, because generally people who are able to work hard is, is a skill in itself, it's a very good skill. If you can direct that in an avenue that correlates with what Fernando said about a good risk opportunity, so it's high risk and potential high reward, and you put your time and energy in that and use your work ethic to outwork other people around you, you're onto a winning formula. So yeah, I think those people have got that kind of, that tough line to tread because often their identity is built in working hard. Myself, I had this for a long time. I did Supernova Elite volume three years in a row and I built a mindset, I work hard, I'm a grinder. I was bragging to my friends how many games I played in a day and a year. Absolutely pathetic looking back. But it was just a narrative <laughs> on my self identity is built around how hard I work and I feel good about it. I feel a self of sense of self-worth. And if I had a day off and did like nothing to sort of speak, I'd be like, Adam, you're a loser. You're not doing enough. You need to step it up. And I think culturally sometimes we get that built into us that we are linked to our effort that we put in. If you have a lot of success and you're kind of cruising, people are like, step it up, do a bit more. Do you deserve what you get? So yeah, I think it's a, a narrative you need to work on and you need to find a way to uh, disincentivize working hard and more being smart. As you mentioned, I think it's all about this kind of smart thinking and being more strategic. What I like about you is you've almost got this like real zoomed out lens and you see the bigger game. There's a big game going on and we can choose all the sub games to play inside of it. I think often we get so dragged into uh, little sub games and we play them all out, not realizing, should you have been playing that game? Was that the game for you, really? Or should you have took a step back and played a different game? So uh, for yourself, as you've started to um, gain more wisdom, which I definitely think you've got a lot of, how has that changed how you've judged the games you should be playing? All right, so right now you've got coaching, you've got playing high stakes. Like you said, you moved to Vegas to uh, take advantage of the higher stakes games there. How has your kind of, with the way you assess opportunities in the poker landscape changed as you've gained more knowledge? The interesting part about my story, and probably some poker players can relate that have a secondary income stream, or in my case, it's more like a primary income stream, is that you're, when you play poker, you're trying to find the sweet spot of making the kind of money, playing the kind of money that is interesting to your bottom line, so like to your entire net worth. So let's say, for example, you have $100 million and you're trying to play poker for a living. If you make $1,000 that day, like it doesn't, it is not going to be fun. Like you can't try hard if you don't need the money, basically. That's really the gist of it. And I uh, remember actually an interview with Ben86 many years ago where he said, why doesn't he play 2550 PLO? And because he was playing like 50, 500, 501,000 against Isildur heads up. And why wouldn't he just go for like on off days off time, play a quarter 50 PLO online to go for the quote unquote easy money. And his answer was, it really sucks to play a game where your opponents are trying 100 times harder than you to win the same amount of money. And that's basically what happens there because there's a disalignment between his effort and the payoff in the real world. Like he can make, he can play a 10K pot, but if he has played hundreds of thousands of dollars swings the last day and earned millions of dollars playing poker, you're not playing with the same weapons at, at that point against your opponents. So in my case, I was playing poker from 2011 until you can say 2018 specifically, like quite heavily. And I would make, a, in, I would say on average, like $200,000 a year, sometimes more, sometimes a little bit less. It depends a little bit on if I would win a tournament or if I play live or something like that, basically. But that would be like the earning range, so to speak. And if you make 200K a year in most countries, like you have a good life and it's going to pay all your bills. As, you, as I started venturing out into business, it, be, it became less interesting to, like I, uh, first of all, I wouldn't have the capacity to work the same amount of hours on poker. And if I would have less capacity and less volume to play poker, I couldn't even earn the 200K, but I would earn less in either smaller stakes games or the same state games, but less volume. And now there's a disalignment happening because the more successful your business becomes, the less interesting it becomes to even grind for $200 an hour, for example, $100 an hour. Like what's the point of even doing that if your business is going really well? At the same time, because I'm a poker player and that's a lot what Adam and I discussed privately, there is a desire to continue playing poker because it's an identity. I was and been a professional poker player for most of my life. So the, the, the most natural thing for me to do when I want to feel productive is to play poker, but it might not be in the right environment that is, that is congruent 
with what I'm trying to achieve by playing poker. So playing poker can be like, a, it can be a distraction to doing the thing that you actually want to do. So for me, it, it really became about understanding when does it make sense for me to play poker given my skill set and given the financial output that I'm looking to get through poker. And uh, either I have to be like, hey, look, if I, uh, I can only play this volume and these stakes to be a consistent winner, and therefore I'm going to be happy making that kind of money and hourly playing poker, and I'm still going to grind it, which is really hard to do because it almost makes no sense, basically. Then uh, either that would be one pathway, which I couldn't, I couldn't do that, or I'm going to seek out games where I can leverage my ability to travel, my ability to play high games because of my financial status, like I have enough money to play the game. And, and maybe even my image as a good player or a coach to get more action or get paid off. So nowadays, like the way I like to play poker the most is I'm traveling to different places. I'm playing live poker. I'm playing high stakes or sometimes super high stakes poker in environments that are difficult for the best the hardest working poker player to even reach because they're not going to travel there they're not going to get into the game they're not going to be there they're not going to be able to afford the game whatever it could be for different reasons that i can get into the game and that's kind of like my focus as a from a poker player's perspective right now i'm in i'm, I'm in barcelona I'm going to go to the king's casino afterwards and travel to vegas afterwards so i'm playing like in pretty good games in all those areas where i can leverage my position but it doesn't make sense for me to be like grinding online mid stakes and trying to make the needle go any way, basically. That's just going to be a, a, an exhausting exercise. Uh, so that, that also takes discipline and perspective and a zoom out lens in order to even understand this is how poker fits into my life. And I mean, we've been working on this for many, many, many hours and it's difficult. It's very challenging. Mm, yeah, especially when your identity is really tied to what you do, it becomes challenging to just almost like zoom out and see what the edge opportunities are, what the kind of things you're trying to get from it intrinsically in terms of playing the game and even externally, what the external uh, kind of metrics you're trying to get from it. When our identity is intertwined with that, sometimes it becomes quite challenging. So I'm, I'm curious for you because you mentioned in the questionnaire we sent you that longevity is one of the things you're most proud of and your ability to reinvent yourself. And I think a lot of players struggle with reinvention. I think a lot of people get very stuck in a certain identity, in a certain mold. So I'm wondering, first of all, what are some of the bigger reinventions you've had to make? And how have you been able to uh, kind of shift your, how you view yourself and your identity as you've moved through your poker career? One of the biggest challenges for poker players is, is, is they're underestimating how long they have been in poker and how many hours went into it. So they're very, they're very specialized. And also they're a huge expert in this one field. When you are a poker player and you want to start a business, for example, a poker coaching business, you have some big advantages because you know the industry, but you also have some, some, uh, some, some uh, hard moments to grind through because you're also a complete beginner in, in business in many ways. But the expectation is that you are already at a certain point in your career, so you want to be a high performer, you want, you want things to work, you have a certain expectation of what's going to happen. Um, it probably won't happen in the beginning of the of the business career. So, for example, if you are a poker player and you make X amount of hourly, once you start venturing out, you're not going to make that hourly. You're going to make probably zero dollars uh, for for a while, and that has to be completely okay if you understand the bigger vision behind it. And the skills you're going to learn are going to feel very rusty in the beginning because you're a complete noob. You're going to learn about things that you that are not fun because you're bad at it and that you never heard before. And it's going to be a tough ride. And I, and I usually like, I tell people like, if you have a poker career and a, and a second career, don't expect, like, don't think that the second career has to be as profitable as the first career right away. It will, will not be this way. Like it, 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 because you're a beginner in this other career, even if it's linked to poker, even if it's poker coaching or something like that, you first have to build up the experience and the knowledge that you have built up as a poker player, which will through many, many, many years. So I think that's a, that is a, is, a, is a big lesson. There are a lot of skill sets you need to learn in business that are very foreign to poker players. And a lot of them are connected also to responsibility and scheduling and, 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 and uh, planning out, working with others, understanding product development, understanding, understanding what people want in poker, 
like what, what your customers want overall. Like there are a lot of things that uh, will feel very different. For example, business is all about decisions that are panning out slowly. So you make a decision and it will take weeks or months sometimes for the decision to really show its effect. In poker, you make decisions, you get immediate feedback and, and something is about to happen. So business is a lot slower in that way. But I think it can also be more rewarding kind of for the same reason, because it's a less reactionary game. And it's more a game of making good long-term investment and decisions into certain alleys that you're sort of paying into. You're building up something. And then as you're building up something, it becomes more and more and more and more worth, which is something that is completely, it's almost inexistent in poker. Like the idea of having an asset is not existent in poker an asset as, as, as far as like a physical thing it could also be an online website course customer based team it could be a software or something i mean these are all things that we have built throughout the years is is completely foreign as a poker player but it can be very very rewarding and i think what a lot of poker players don't necessarily understand is like they think why is a poker player going into coaching and it's a complete misunderstanding of of the poker coaching industry so if you're a poker player and you know how to make $100 an hour, for example, you have that skill set, <clears throat> that skill set might be worth $100,000, $200,000 a year, something along those lines, because you also have to study. And while you study, you make $0. So you study and you play. While you play, you make $100. Maybe per year you make $150K, let's say something along those lines. Now, if you can teach 500 people how to make $100 an hour or even $50 an hour, and they pay you $100, let's say, then you have a $600,000 business. Uh, if, if you have 500 customers, if you have 250 customers, but you double the price, you have another $600,000 business. And that kind of business that you have there, let's say half a million dollar business, is a business that is going to have no swings. You're not going to have losing days. And also, you will consistently build up towards having an asset. So at some point, you're going to have to make less videos. You're going to have maybe better methods of acquiring new customers. You might have like external coaches that work for you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You have a real asset to build towards. And that all comes from the initial skill set of learning how to make $100 an hour. So suddenly you leverage that skill set by having taught the skill set to hundreds of people. And now you have an asset. So you don't need to, tell, taught, you don't need to taught, um, coach people anymore at this point, but they can learn from your past videos. And now suddenly you're leveraging past videos, reputation, et cetera, uh, and customer base into a long-term asset. And maybe through that, you have synergetic businesses. Like in my case, I have like an ambassadorship with GG Poker. I have an affiliate business that runs behind as well. So if you use synergetic uh, business models alongside it, then you have what I would call a, fl a flywheel. So you start attaching more and more things to your synergetic business model, and it comes, becomes faster and faster and faster. And suddenly you have six, seven income streams that are all stemming from this one skill set you had initially, which was knowing how to make $100 per hour. And suddenly you're making like way more than that uh, based on the assets you have built. So I think that's the appeal, generally speaking, to get into coaching or business in general from your initial skill set. And it's completely misunderstood by poker players. Like they, they think, oh, if you don't know how to make 100K anymore, you're going to start teaching and you're going to make 100K. Like it's not really, it's not really that... Um, in that landscape. What I really like about your story and what you were sharing there is almost like the unlimited opportunities where the poker can make available. And I think a lot of players starting out might not be as far ahead as you. You've been in the game a long time since 2006. You've reinvented yourself a lot of times. But I think you're a great example of staying in the game and reinvent yourself around what's available and pivoting when things have become available and seeing what's available from that lens. And for you, obviously, you've started out as a full player playing full time. Uh, like a lot of players will just be sole income playing poker. You gr you're grinding, grinding, grinding. But at the same time, I think what you do a better job of than almost all players I've spoke with is you're always taking a step back to look around. What else available what are the opportunities are, 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 are on my landscape what are the games going to be playing i think for some players like they, they might have no idea they might just be playing poker leveraging one skill set but i think you're a great example of what can come further down the line i think this hopefully this this podcast episode will encourage some players to think a bit bigger think a bit outside of the lens of just one one skill set one format and think further in the future where do you want to be and how could you potentially 
leverage the skills that you're developing now into certain avenues in the future. That may be coaching, that may be other things, it may be starting your own business, maybe anything. But for most poker players, they're probably going to pivot at some point out of poker. And I think it's really good to go, right, how can I leverage all this time and energy into uh, what I'm doing? But also in the future, I can use that for something else. Because I've spoken with many players who've kind of felt trapped in poker. And they're almost like, I put so much time into it, so much energy. I've literally slogged away. And all I can do now is play poker because my skills are useless elsewhere. And it's, it's always such a real like disconnect between how valuable the skills you currently have are and how there's, there's, a, there's a pivot just to the side of you that you're not seeing, which you could use your skill set and leverage. Not, not super easy, like, like you said, like leverage into another kind of business or an idea. Generally, you drop income quite a lot in the short term, but you can leverage that skill set. I always feel like a little bit sorry for players and a bit sad when I, when I hear players go, I'm stuck, I've got no, nothing to give to the world apart from play poker. And I was like, right, you just need to change the way you're looking at things because as you've mentioned, being a poker player, you also will likely be very, very good at other things. You have opportunities galore. If you've managed to beat mid stakes online, wow, you're a sick kind of individual. Your mind is great at problem solving. You can leverage that into lots of different things. So yeah, anyone who's listening who's like full grind mode, full leverage in one skill of poker, know there's other avenues in the future, which hopefully Fernando will encourage you guys to explore. Just one, one tip of that to like finish up that thought. If you are currently, you feel like you're stuck in poker, best thing you can do is first of all, don't tell yourself you're stuck in poker because you're going to stay stuck if you tell yourself you're stuck in poker. But also the second thing is just consume like what holds you back between where you are right now and your next career or, or a side gig is skills. You don't have the skills. Okay, so what, but it's not a big problem. You can learn skills. So what you want to do is you want to learn skills and you can get inspired by listening to a lot of podcasts outside of the poker industry. You know, just like listen to a bunch of podcasts within business, within different avenues that you might be interested in anyway. It could be uh, sports, nutrition, business. It could be crypto, finances, whatever it could be. But listen to podcasts so that you can hear other voices. And then through that, um, you become probably interested in some fields. Like you personally think, oh, this is a field that is interesting to me. And start thinking, what are skills that I need to acquire to succeed in that field? And how can I get to those skills? Similar to poker, you hire a coach, you get into a course, you join a group, a Discord channel, whatever it could be. But basically, the only thing that holds you back is skills. And they are as easy acquirable as ever right now with the whole online landscape. So... It doesn't have to happen overnight, but start consuming different information and look into different avenues to diversify your skill set. And, and the faster you know it, you know, a year has passed by and you know a lot more about a certain area and you start making some moves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it reminds me of Alex Amosi, who's a great business coach. He talks about kind of three things, only three things in the way of any goal. The first one is your beliefs, what you believe is possible. If you believe it's not possible, you're not going to get off the start line and move forward. So we need to... Uh, believe that something's possible in terms of avenue. Next one is skills, acquiring skills over time to achieve that objective. And the third one, which kind of reinforces the skill learning is character traits. What identity character traits do I need to form so I can develop those skills consistently over time towards that objective? And that's it, beliefs, character traits, skills. And if you get those three together, and also when you're trying to achieve a goal, be honest with yourself, which one am I missing? Do I believe it's possible? Have I got the skills and acquiring them? And where, where my, where's my leaks in this kind of kind of pyramid towards success? But yeah, really, really good. And I think it's a, it's a really powerful mindset because if you're just missing skills, you can acquire them. If you're a defect in your personality or you're not smart enough, that's pretty hard to bridge. But if it's just a skill, all right, skills, I can learn skills. That's something I've done in the past. If you're a poker player and you think you can't learn skills, re-examine re all the things you've learned throughout your career because you're a skill learning machine. So uh, yeah, I think it's a really positive lens for his takeaway. Hi guys, Rene aka The Wacko here with a quick Mechanics of Poker 2.0 announcement. In our program you will get access to 80 plus hours of content in which we will explain you all aspects needed in order to become a more successful poker player. Now one of these of course is the technical aspect of the game in which I'll be explaining you all the mechanics behind poker strategies. We'll be talking about GTO, exploitive play, with an extra focus on the why behind certain strategies and why the population has certain leaks. And to increase your win rate even further, we've recently added a river bluff and bluff catching section so you can increase your EV when those pots become very big. Our mindset and performance coach Adam Carmichael, he took care of the mental game and performance section of this program in which he will teach you everything you need to know in order to break through limiting beliefs, better handle your emotions, break free from tilt and play your A game more consistently. 
And last but not least, we've added the management and optimization section in the program in which we will give you various tips and tricks to make it more likely for your poker career to succeed and how to continuously improve as a poker player. Now on top of that, this concept is continuously evolving based on feedback and suggestions we get from our community. Next to all this content, you will have access to our exclusive Discord community, monthly live Q&A calls, and one-on-one -on -one coaching session in which we are going to be reviewing if you have been implementing the stuff that we teach you in the mechanics of poker correctly. So do you think you have what it takes to master the mechanics of poker? Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com and maybe you will get a chance to work with me and Adam and make more progress in your poker career. But for now, without further ado, let's get back into more goodness in today's episode. Hey, Rene, I'm interested in yourself as well. You've had a long career and you've had a lot of longevity. What have been some of the key character traits that you've developed or instilled in yourself that have allowed you to continue to engage with poker over the years? I think a lot of what Fernando also said, like reinventing yourself and adapting and not staying stuck in a rigid way of thinking. Like throughout, I mean, online poker is an ever-changing landscape. I mainly stuck to the online poker world. How though I actually have been playing, I have actually played live poker this summer in the first time in many, many years. And I can indeed confirm what Fernando said, definitely a lot softer than, than the online streets. And you can also see the online streets, you know, by in indeed what Fernando also said, tracking data. You can see that, for example, the average win rate of a rag in the last four years, yeah, it has declined significantly. So these are signs that maybe you should look for a different environment if you want to make a lot of money, or you can indeed double down and try to improve your skills to still succeed in the same environment. But indeed, maybe changing environment is the smarter solution, I would say. I was going to say easier solution, uh, but it's smarter solution. And that's it's funny, a lot of the, what we're talking about, I noticed that I have a lot of, uh, indeed, these beliefs as well in my head of like, exactly what I just, going there, the easier money, there's something that feels, it feels... There's, there's some resistance there. And that resistance is indeed like the pride that you get, right? From uh, doubling down and working harder. And it it, it 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 has something. It's really stupid rationally, right? Rationally, it makes a lot of sense. But I do feel there's a, there's a disconnect here between what my brain thinks, all the knowledge that you shared, and what, what, my, what, what, what my belly thinks, or however you want to call it. There's, there's definitely some disconnect there. But yeah, over the years... Definitely changed a lot. For example, as Fernando also said, pre-solver, you needed different skills, actually skills that I was very good at. Uh, and then post-solver, you needed different skills. I was always in the team as well. If something came out, I immediately start using it. It doesn't matter what I... what people Wasting all these hours arguing about what they think about it. I don't care what, what my opinion is about this software coming out. doesn't matter. Everyone's going to use it. I have to use it. So I have to find a way to best use it. What I think about it, I'm not going to waste energy and cry about something coming out. Oh, now AI is there. Oh, AI is there. How can I use it? Because everyone's going to use it. So how can I use it better in, in how to gain a net? So I think that mentality, kind of like the adapt or die mentality, that I think is, is definitely part of why I'm still around. And I always look for new people as well. For example, the people that I've done strategy with, they keep on changing as well. I keep on reaching out to new people. The people I do strategy with nowadays and the way I approach poker strategy also changed. I'm not stuck in my old beliefs. I'm seeing new people do new stuff. I'm always open-minded. I think being open-minded is the key to keep on growing. It's funny actually that you mentioned uh, Hermosi there. I think Fernando also not, not that Hermosi. I literally last night watched the web, uh, seminar that he gave about money where he literally talks about everything that we just talked about. He talks about the yeah, people, what is work? That the thing is literally the first thing that he starts with. Let's define work. And then he comes with the traditional definition, but he then talks a lot about leverage. Oh, and how do you scale it? It's very, very interesting, very interesting uh, seminar. So I thought it was, I was like, I'm, I'm listening to a repeat of what I listened to last night. So, uh, yeah. I mean, on the, on Hermosi, that note Fernando is giving the same of my, uh, advice as Hermosi. We, are, we're, we have some good information on our hands. He also, he lives in Vegas as well right now. And so, sometimes I see him in different restaurants where I'm also like going. And uh, I was on a call actually with his wife, uh, Leila Hermosi, because they have a business model acquisition.com where they acquire basically equity in your firm. And mm -hmm. they, they have an interesting proposition. They say, 
we're going to triple your business slash your revenue in your business within, I think they say, we're going to 3x your business in two years. And if we don't achieve that, we're going to give you back the equity that we bought for the cash without asking back for the cash. And you basically free rolled our entire expertise and back office that they're providing to your business. So I, I went on a call with uh, Leila Hermosin and her, uh, and her team from acquisition.com because I was interested to see what they can do for my business. And in the beginning of the call, she said, well, your business is currently located in Switzerland. So it's not part of the, uh, it's, not, it's, it, it's out of question that we cannot invest in it because we are not going to buy equity in companies that are outside of the US. But because we're already on a call, we're going to give you 20 minutes time to just pick our brains for your business and so on. And in those 20 minutes, I learned more than like in hundreds of hours of anything else that I did, which was absolutely incredible, like how well they understood the market of coaching online, even though they have no idea about poker because they have just skimmed through hundreds of businesses and know so many business owners that run different educational platforms online. I learned so much in those 20 minutes for free. It was invaluable. And it just shows again, like if you reach out trying to make some moves, you can learn some things along the way, but sometimes even for free. So it was uh, super interesting. And we do, I mean, we both listen to Alex uh, because it's great advice and it's for free. It's no, for free uh, listen, well. listen. Anyone interested in business, marketing, sales, uh, Hormozy stuff for free and like by far, by far the best advice out there. When you see him in the restaurant, you order him a dessert. He's like, hashtag never skip dessert. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hashtag never use the stairs. <laughs> like the guy, is, the guy is super in shape. Always takes desserts, never takes the stairs. What what is what me, what's interesting to me is like I've been following as we discussed before the before this recording I've been following the brand mechanics of poker uh, since the beginning and watched your uh, your podcast early on as well like what is your guys experience with transitioning from poker playing into like stable but also business side of things for yourself like how was the because on this podcast we usually hear from the guests but I'm also interested in like what was your journey in the last couple of years, like building up this brand and the product line behind it as well? Uh, that's that's quite, a, quite, quite an adventure, I can tell you. So basically, I, I switched to a CFP model, coaching for profit, when I was at the peak of my career. Both, I think two, two main reasons. One, I, I had that thing that everyone has when they reach success, you're at the top and you're like, ah, I thought it would feel better. So... I guess I was like, uh, hmm, maybe I should do different. And I always had the idea of coaching. Uh, I really like making content. For example, with my with my study partners, I would prepare like presentation and present my ideas to them. I really like that that aspect. And I don't know anymore who I got influenced by at that moment, but I was also already thinking about in terms of skill. Like I'm always trading my time for money. I think that, I don't know who came with that at that point, but that was the main phrase of him. I, I'm still trading my time for money. How can I scale this? So I figured, well, exactly what you said. If I know how to make a lot of money with playing poker, if I teach that to others, then I can skill without, And but this was kind of a flawed idea. I was like, without having to do the hours. Oh. Well, guess what? Uh, the passive income uh, that trap. Was, yeah, that was kind of the passive income trap. So yeah, that definitely was not passive. But this was also due to my, in hindsight, I think I used the CFP to justify me diving into the rabbit hole of poker strategy. I would say that is actually what has happened. Uh, I would now do it in a different way, but basically I had them, I, I really loved studying, I still love studying the game of poker. And basically now I had students who were paying me to study the game of poker. So I found a way that I could, I think there was another thing that I got influenced by. They said, Try to find something that you love to do and try to find a way to get paid doing what you love to I do. See. And I loved studying playing poker more than playing poker. So I was like, well, if I get students, they pay me to study the game and come up with strategies and stuff. And then I explain it to my students and they execute. That's the way that I can get paid doing what I love to do, which is develop poker strategies. So I started doing that. And I think at some point we had like 20 students and we were doing it mainly live in location. And I was looking... Like the next step then is scale further, right? You're going to scale online. Um, but I did also at some point start to notice a lot of resistance in terms of what I was doing and what I actually wanted to do. I actually missed really having time for myself and having time playing poker myself. So then at that point, I was like, 
do I really want to continue down the CFP and business route? Because in order to scale a CFP, you also, for example, you need to set up good affiliate deals. You have to load up more people in, in, in like the lower skills, the 10 NLs, the 25 NLs. And in my calculations, it was kind of a trap for a lot of the low stakes players. It's very hard to be on a CFP and grind your way out. So basically the CFP model just loads up a lot of layers on the bottom. They're fine with them just grinding 50 and L. You know, it's just another number in your business. That's fine. And I guess the guys who run good, they can outperform the profit share and therefore they can reach a higher, higher level. And I don't know, it's, it's not something that I was intrinsically motivated for. Like all the students that I had, the goal was, listen, we're going to try to become the best in the world. And scaling that model, it gave me, would give me a lot of job and tasks that I just did not want to do. I mean, you talked about this. Sometimes you need to do things that you don't want to do. But I just was like, like, or you pay someone to do it. Yeah. That's so, also... <laughs> so I did. I did also start to hire people and work with other people in business. Uh, obviously, yeah, you you learn a lot there as well. I also I had business partners uh, with some. You know, I parted ways at some point. And right now, I don't have any employees. I mean, I work together with Adam, but I was growing and growing the business. Then at some point, also. So at some point, I then transitioned the CFP to the mechanics of poker, which I did because it freed up a bit more time for me. I kind of have the quality of a CFP program. I have the proven results of a CFP program, but we put it more in like a course type of model. So I figured at that moment for me, it was the best of both worlds because I did enjoy the content. I had all this content. So also from a financial perspective, yeah, I have all these core, I have all this content on the... Uh, on the planks better i put that out there and then i started to scale we also uh for i think one year opened like the poker ambition academy before that was also poker ambition now it's uh, only the mechanics of poker thanks to alex hermosi by the way he was uh, one of the inspirations for the rebrand uh wow. so basically then we started to also give webinars to lower stakes we tried to increase the amount of products that we offer but if you increase the amount of products that you offer you need a bigger team Bigger team meets more cost, meets more headaches, more people to communicate with me. And then at some point I noticed that I was doing work. No, I was creating more work and creating more products, not necessarily for myself, but for my employees to have a job. So I wasn't paying them for nothing. That was really a wake up call for me. I think I had two calls with two people that one really, really asked me the question like, what does, in this case, it was poker ambition. What does this business offer you? What do you want out of it, out of your life? And then I realized that what it was giving me at that moment was not what I wanted because I was spending a lot of time on it. I was no longer very motivated to do it. It gave me a lot of stress in order to grow it further, more, more headaches. And just, just the fact of scaling it, it wasn't really making me happy. So then at some point, I... I actually got 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 the book from Hermosi, the the first one that he read, the hundred million offers. Read that, done done everything, rebranded the whole thing, doubled down on one program, mechanics of poker, rebranded the whole thing, and now I would say it's. I, I work way less, make way more money, so that's, uh, <laughs> nice. in terms of that progress, that 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 has been going well. Uh, obviously, you can scale it further, but this was another thing of another call that I had with a friend of mine who said. Listen, you always have the mindset of everything can be improved. Everything can be better. You can find a solution to everything. And I will basically not quit. Okay. But he said, to what cost? Who are, who are you trying to prove that you can make poker ambition a success and, and, and skill it as big as, for example, your coaching company or an upswing poker or something like that? He said, you can do it, but how, how much effort will it cost? And when you reach it, is it then still considered a win? Or did you just do it to prove to yourself that you could do it? And I was like, hmm. Interesting. I never questioned my my own thought about like I I never questioned that mindset to sometimes be in the way of your fluffy word, your happiness or your or your satisfaction or how or that the fact that you live a, a nice day to day life, right? So that was another very big wake up call that helped me decide on basically stopping what poker ambition was doing and rebranding it completely to the mechanics of poker. Now we have uh, the podcast actually also wrote something out is something that we really enjoy doing it's it's a great benefit like we get to new meet new people i get to talk about poker and get to talk about my performance we all get to do what we love to do and obviously it's a great way of growing our brand uh and then yeah monetize it for example with the mechanics of Co poker coaching program shout out to the program um 
yeah. And basically from here, we have further ideas how to scale it further, but I am way more conscious and it's a, it's a constant struggle of, yeah, you can keep on playing that game of growing and everything has to scale. But actually nowadays I'm a bit, I've taken a little bit of a step back from that and try to be a bit more conscious of what I'm trying to grow and what I'm trying to scale and especially why, if that mm. makes sense. So that's uh, you know, you asked, that's kind of the story. And uh, here we are today. I actually also had another question for you because this is something that, that I personally uh, struggle with. Um, for example, when you switch into coaching, because for example, I, I could now go full into coaching, for example, which I did during the CFP. Like one-on-one -on -one coaching or into poker coaching and you don't play poker anymore imposter syndrome sort of comes up or at least something something similar you lose a bit touch with what actually is going on in the games and at some point who are you to coach to tell someone that you can coach someone while you're you're not currently active at the games that you say that people that you're going to help people to get to did you did you experience any oh, struggles yeah. with that when you transitioned <laughs> to poker or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I worked a year straight with Jared Tendler, and the main subject was uh, imposter sy syndrome. It was a couple of years ago. And um, now, with my extremely old mind uh, reflecting on a couple of years ago, I would say that. I th well, I'll tell you a story. So, I started doing a little bit of one on one coaching in January of this year because I was traveling to Thailand and I was like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do there. So let's get a job, which is making one-on-one -on -one coaching. So I got a bunch of people interested and signed them up and jumped into some calls. And some of the players were five card PLO players and five card is very new. And even though we do release the solver and so on, I, I wasn't as good at five card. So the guy sent me his database and I'm like, oh my God, this, the learning curve is going to be massive to like learn how to give this guy feedback on a game I'm not that good at, but I know database analysis. So I did a little bit of analysis and so on. And after spending like six hours on this thing without charging, obviously, because I'm like, this is my, I'm going to, I coached this guy for five hours and first hour I'm going to tell him something that he doesn't know. So I prepared myself for six hours going to the call. And then before the call, I told myself, you know what, I'm going to tell this guy that this is going to be the first and last session we do because I can't teach this game. I cannot provide enough value. And this session is for free, but I just can't do it. So we went onto the call and I told him like, listen, this is the first and only session we're going to do. It's for free. I just can't do it. Like, I just don't think I can add enough value because I don't even play five card that much. So we did like database analysis. I gave him feedback on conceptual things. And after the session, he was like, this was the best coaching I ever received. Please don't stop. Please don't stop. Let's continue the sessions. And I'm like, I mean, the thing is, you don't know, like the way you overcome imposter syndrome is not by what you tell yourself or your non-customers. It is what the customer says, if it's good or not. And if you do one-on-one -on -one coaching or group coaching and they tell you, you know what? I learned so much and my results are improving then you're doing your job, which is not being a player, which is being a coach. So they are the judges. And the more feedback you get, the clearer and more objective is your, is your self-image as well. And it, again, it shouldn't be by just random people on the internet. It should be by your actual customers. This was helpful. This was great. This was amazing. And oftentimes, if you take on the role as a coach in poker, a ton of it is not the, a ton of the uh, things you know are not necessarily build up experiences from playing. It is doing more research than your students because they don't have time or don't take the time to do it. So for example, if you dig into their databases and they don't have the skill set of a database analysis analyst and you find leaks in their game and then point them out to them, you save them a huge amount of time and you actually worked on a slightly different skill set than they are because they're all about implementation and playing and you're all about analyzing and giving feedback. So you're taking on different roles and at the end of the day, the customer is the one that decides how much value you provide it. And that's how you should judge yourself based on. And you will usually find that you know so much more about the game than you thought you will, uh, you would, and you can provide so much more value than you thought you would. Um, and then automatically that sort of idea of imposter just re gets removed or disappears by just the pure feedback you get from, from your customers.
Yeah, a way, a way that that we usually also do it. I always give the guarantee with all our, all, all all the products. I say, listen, if you didn't like the product, we we will we will pay you back the money. This is this is a way that you know I have the customers. They decide for themselves if they thought it was valuable. Well, since oh no, wait, it happened once. <laughs> I remember we always said no one ever asked, but it happened once that someone wanted I think half half his money back, and yeah, once over many years that's yeah, not it's not it's not necessarily bad result right obviously like maybe just my way or adam's way or both our ways uh of coaching just didn't resonate with him yeah you know uh, uh th this can happen but there's also a very big difference with being a poker coach and poker player it's like the performance aspect of poker is very specific um and someone can be a great performer, but a bad coach and a good coach, but a worse performer. And it's feel like, especially if you spend a lot of time coaching, you get a bit rusty in terms of your actual performing in game, the many hours you can concentrate uh, and stuff like that. So it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's quite an interesting thing. The way I try to solve it, I try to solve it uh, both internally, right? But to be fair, also still a very big part externally. Uh, so I'm I'm not yet I'm not yet fully enlightened to to the to the inner camp, and I mean another thing that I realized I, I'm curious what what your perspective. But the more I I ventured into business, started to have to work together with other people, the more I actually started to miss being a poker player. I realized, oh, yeah. damn, being a poker player is great. So, like I said, I feel like right now I'm very happy with that we positioned ourselves, or in this case, talk for myself. We I positioned myself exactly in the sweet spot. I can do the amount of coaching that I like to do. I can do the amount of poker of poker strategy that we like to do with the mechanics of poker. I have the community there. Uh, but I also still have time to play poker myself. So I feel like right now I'm positioning myself in, in a sweet spot. And I'm a bit afraid that if I would scale it further, then it would mean, okay, I have to get more people on the team. So I'm, I'm a bit hesitant. I'm a bit, I'm a bit in the comfort zone at the moment, I, I would say. Sounds like you want to change if you. So if you I'm not, I'm not sure it. if I want to change. Do I want to change? Like I, I, I there, don't there are a lot of growing know. pains in like acquiring new skills, especially like business. And uh, and um, another great business content creator that I followed over the years, he doesn't make a lot of content anymore. Is Sam Ovens? I'm not sure if you know him. He's the yeah, owner of Consulting.com, and yeah, I mean Consulting.com is an excellent course. But apart from that, he's a great business mind, and he. He taught me through the through his program uh, or his videos on YouTube even that scale is a two part process. It's it's scale and clean up and scale and clean up. You always need to clean up the operation before you further scale. So I think in part that there are growing pains in building up a business. And I think you you know sometimes you scale too fast and you're like this is overwhelming and not fun. And I'm like I'm 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 kind of um, it feels like you're giving up. But actually what you're doing is you're you're taking a step back to clean up the operation and look back around it. And then at some point, the itch will be, you know, need to be scratched and you're going to be like, okay, well, but if I would actually scale a little bit further. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so another... I, I agree. When, when you said the story, it's like, yeah, yeah, it, it makes sense. It, exactly what you said. You scale too fast. You have, it becomes a bit too overwhelming. You clean up. That's why I, I, we did a drastic cleanup. Uh, and indeed, like, I, I cannot help myself because I also, it's, it's just like in poker, right? When this kind, of, this kind of market is also interesting. Oh, it's okay. So if I do this, then this happens. Oh, interesting. Like it's 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 in me. But I guess I did learn more about like my own values and what I find important in my life. And I can at least take that in consideration when I do scale to to if that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you're scale right, you're is right. like you're again, right. your if your skills are improved in business, then it will also feel very different. I like this. Uh, so one of the interviews with Alex Ramosi. Uh, one thing that he said that really resonated with my business situation, especially back then when I heard it, was your business usually fails at the uh, abilities of the owner and not at the uh, at the size of the opportunity. So oftentimes what happens is you build up a business to X size, amount of employees, revenue, customers, whatever it is. And then you, um, a lot of business owners, they go sideways then and they start a new venture. And they build it up to the same breaking point, and then it, they feel like the opportunity has uh, maximized already, and they cannot go further. So they're going to go to the next business, and they build up like these different opportunity vehicles, but they all feel like micromanaged because they could never go beyond 
the thing that they build it up to, and they think it is because of the size of the, of the of the opportunity, but it isn't. It is actually their skills that is holding them back. So at some point, it will be. It comes to the decision point where you're like, you know what? Let's not look left or right. Let's not switch perspectives, but actually think about what is the skill skill required right now to actually improve my business to the next level, make it bigger. And there will be some growing pains first, but the most important thing about growing pains is just like in the gym, it's only a temporary pain that is out there. Like you making the business bigger and scaling it, you will have some sucky things to do on your to-do list, but it's temporary if you do your job right and you develop the business further. At some point, it will be like, oh, this is now way easier. Like for me, for example, running the business with like, 10, 15 people that we have right now is way easier than it was with five people. It's way, way, way easier. Yeah. But it wasn't always like that. It was like in the beginning, it was like we went to 10 to 15, back to 10. It was like a nightmare, like super long hours. I was like super overwhelmed playing poker and putting in hours that way because I was so much in business. And, and then at some point, you hire the right people. They take the right responsibilities. You clean out your operations and you ask yourself, uh, what are the essential tasks in my business that really need to take place and what is all just optional? And suddenly you uh, everything becomes a lot, a lot easier after a while. And you're like, wow, this is amazing. Now suddenly I build up an asset and I take the role in my business that I enjoy the most. This is also like maximum freedom, basically, if you can do that, because you find the right partners to work with. Like someone will be better than, will be the thing that you hate doing in your business, someone will like doing and they will be good at it and they will do it. And the thing that you are really good at, you can maximize your time in that and take full advantage of it if the, the, the rest of the business is, is uh, managed by the people that are good at it. And in my case, so it's the same thing. Like I have visionary roles in my business and coaching roles. And, um, and uh, I'm, I'm basically more talking with my business more long-term. Where are we going? What are the big decisions? And um, how is the industry changing? Like keeping my pulse on that. And I also talk one-on-one -on -one with a lot of people in the business to understand their incentives, like wh where they want to take their career within my business. How can I support that? How can we support that? But there are a million other tasks that I have nothing to do with because they're all administrative nature and I hate all of them. So I don't do any of them and I'm completely happy with that, but it wouldn't be if I had to take any on, if I had to take any of these tasks on, I wouldn't be, but I have the right partners that are, that are understanding how to build the business around me. And I think that is, especially when you are the face of the company, the most important skill set is to find people that can build a business around your skill set and respect that. And they don't expect you to do things that you don't want to do, but they understand where you're good at and they do the rest around you. It's kind of like when you are a CEO and you have personal assistant, like they clean up the, the shit around you so you can be good at the stuff that you actually really enjoy. Yeah, you're... you're that's also what I had to think about early in the podcast when you said that double down on the skills that you're actually good at uh, instead of trying to do all the things that, that you don't like and are also not good at as well. So yeah, you, you, you've given me a lot of stuff to think about. Uh, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, it wasn't like I was already thinking about it, but you definitely gave a lot of good in, inputs and good perspectives. I'm sure uh, some of the listeners uh, can relate. Going back to, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to switch here a little bit to the actual playing poker. I was curious. You also mentioned that you've invested over 100K in coaching. Now, sure, some of that were, I think, also mentioned seminars or business coaching or mindset coaching. From a technical perspective, what has been the biggest strategical breakthrough that you can remember in your career? Well, so one of the things is like the bigger your coaching platform becomes, the less people want to coach you. So like for me, getting coaching is very, very difficult. Even if I would pay a lot of money, the main feedback is like the people that I ask personally if they want to coach me because I think they're the best players in the world, basically. Their feedback is even if you like, if, if they would put up a high hourly, like $2,000 an hour, for example, and they would coach me, they are aware that they're basically coaching thousands of people at the same time through me. So they don't want to do that. Uh, which is definitely one of the big downsides of having a coaching company is that that's how you're perceived. You're coaching the whole industry. So they don't want to, they don't want to help you. So a lot of the stuff in terms of how I get better is more like self-taught or within our own coaches. So our own coaches, they communicate with each other and help each other that way. But I would say the biggest breakthrough, 
breakthrough for me really was I, I became, so the solver, the introduction of a solver into any form of poker has different periods. The first period is like when everyone, when no one really knows how to use the solver and they're playing around with it. And some people get more out of it and some people less. And I would say in that period, I excelled the most because it is not as much about precision and execution and more about macro level understanding. Oh, we see something, some trends, some new ideas of a solver that we haven't thought about. How does that change the meta and how does that change my strategy? That was what I was, I was better at that than coming up with my own stuff prior to the solver. And then when the another stage of a solver introduction is then the, when the solver introduction is more matured, which is where we are right now in no limit and PLO. Now it is more about memorization and accuracy than it is about conceptual understanding. Because nowadays you have all the sims, like you have all the spots and all the flops and all the turns, all the rivers, especially in no limit. So you don't need to work with a subset where, you, where it's more about conceptual takeaways. You can work just with the exact solution at all times and it's super fast and available. And I would say that is not my strong suit. Like I am not a big proponent or fan of like execution on a very precise level and memorization uh, likewise. So I'm not, I'm not like, I couldn't train with a trainer for like five hours and be motivated to continuously do that. And I think that is also the reason why I coach most of the time, right? Because I enjoy conceptual teaching more than executional learning or memorization. So I would say now, nowadays, my edges are more coming from like live poker because in live poker, people don't understand any concept, basically. And the importance of concepts in live poker is much higher than online because there are more variables at play. So in live poker, you play a lot more multi-way pots and there are a lot less solutions for it. So you need to have more conceptual understanding just because the spots are so variable. Like you can have four-way pots of different stack sizes and people have very extreme tendencies that are super exploitable. So you need to have a conceptual understanding how to deal with it. Online, it's more like most spots are one-on-one -on, -one on the flop and you have the same SBR and you have the same ranges in play. And it's more about precision of execution, which you would have to have time to learn beforehand through a solver. I'm mainly a business person and a coach. I don't have time to memorize and train with a solver. So on that, in, in that specific field, I'm like less knowledgeable and cannot compete at the same level as someone who's only playing poker. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's in that. No, direction. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, can, I can, I can definitely relate. I'm way more of a conceptual learner myself. And I think that has a lot of benefits. Let's say, for example, I play an MTT or like when I started to play live, like, yeah, okay. The specific situation is different, but the same concepts, the ideas, like the heuristics or the concepts behind why a solver does what it does, it still applies. So you solve the puzzle at that moment. It's like, oh, well, conceptually speaking, this is probably, and you know, you're not going to be as accurate, but that's the whole idea, right? If you play in scenarios that constantly keep a chain, you cannot be as accurate, but you can apply certain concepts. And with those concepts, you will gain an edge. You, you grew up obviously pre-solver. When you started using the solver, what was like the biggest mistake that you made? when From using the solver? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question think about it so i i started using solvers with po be, even though i was playing plo because i figured that there has to be some link which was true and i i learned a lot more about equity realization and positional disadvantage and polarization I, le I learned a lot of these concepts from no limit and then trying to apply them to plo so by the time i worked with monker solver which is a plo solver that came out later much later than po i was already I already knew what a solver kind of does and how to work with it in some ways. And that's also why my products back then, 2017, were all based around Monker Solver because I already understood that a solver in PLO will change the entire landscape. So obviously there, there were some mistakes. I would say the main mistake is not to, is not to understand that people probably do these days as well, is to don't, they don't really understand that a solver output is a hypothetical game that is just a, it's just all about action reaction. 
So this player does X and so you do Y and that's modeled in the sim. And that is not applicable to real life in all cases. It is just modeling as a, a hypothetical equilibrium that can teach you some concepts of reaction and action. And if you don't understand that, then like if that flies over your head, even after really thinking about what that means, then you're always going to be like many steps behind of how do you actually use a solver basically. And I think that's, that is probably just like blind application is probably what most people struggle with. And, and even to this day, the only way to overcome blind application of a solver really is to have exploitative data. So you need to be like, well, people aren't check raising this frequency or this range composition in this spot. Here's the data. And therefore, the actual solution to this problem is going to be like this. That is a very, like poker is a very difficult game. And finding good answers to very complex problems with imperfect information is very difficult. So I would say the, the biggest challenge people face, and also myself in explaining the game and, and trying to teach it, is that there is no blind application of anything available, like possible that makes sense. And at the same time, there's no perfect information about how to actually play. Like in chess, you can say, this is the best move that you can make right now, period. There's no discussion. In, in, hold, in, in poker, that's just not possible because you have imperfect information and uh, therefore you can't solve for what is the best move right now. Yeah, I would take that uh, action reaction even further because it all starts basically with the ranges because the ranges determine the equities which incentivizes you to take a certain action. Then the next step is indeed, well, if I take this action, how does someone react? So there's like two components. You have the action reaction and the actual ranges that incentivize or disincentivize a certain action. And you have to start to, and this is, I think, the most important thing to study and to play around with. What are the impacts if I change some of these variables, right? How does the solution shift right or left? And what does that mean? What kind of concept can I learn from that? And can I start applying at the table so I can adjust to different situations where I think the ranges are different or where I think my opponent will play different. Because for example, like how EV is generated is indeed also dependent on how your opponent acts or reacts, right? Not just, mm. oh yeah, uh, this is, th th this is, uh, and out of that you can learn like, oh, versus this type of player profile, I can generate EV in this way or these type of hands, they go down in EV, this kind of hands go up in EV in this type of lines. And that's where I think, you really start to understand poker and which becomes way more applicable, like you said, in live environments where the situations are way less static, where you suddenly have, where you have way more different profiles. You have people who are in different moods. Uh, you have, uh, yeah, you have, like you said, four-way pots. You have, you have all kinds of weird stuff going on. So that's when you really have to start applying these concepts. Um, when you worked through your way throughout, throughout the ranks, uh, what was like the toughest jump you had to make in stakes? Which which jump was the toughest? I think the most difficult is when you go from mid to high stakes because the, the high stakes ecosystem is very different to mid stakes ecosystem. Mid stakes is a lot more about consistent. There's more consistent action, at least there used to be. Still nowadays in PLO, there is like there's more consistent action and, and um, you don't face... For the most part, you don't face overrolled people at that stake. So overrolled means people that are just crushing consistently because they would already have moved up. When you play high stakes, people are constrained by the availability of action more so than their bankroll many times. So you will face opponents that have crushed this limit forever and they still play the same limit because there's no higher game. So you will face the best of the best and at mid stakes, you just don't because they have moved on to higher stakes to whatever is available. So therefore the higher stakes action is like extra predatory, which means the action usually only runs if there is a whale in the game and that creates a different dynamic. And the dynamic is that the whale chooses which stakes you're playing. So if you're trying to jump, for example, from PLO 500 back in the days that, that would be running on stars, and you would want to play PLO 2K, which is usually the next stake. That's four times a jump. And maybe the whale doesn't want to play 2K, but he wants to play 5K. So, and the same player pool will form around the 5K pool, a 5K whale than a 2K whale because everyone is overrolled or taking shots. So you have to be willing, if you want to play high stakes, 
to sometimes just double the stakes for whatever reason, because the fish plays 5k, not 2k. And that means you're going to face way bigger variance, monetarily speaking, than when you play two, uh, 2k. And maybe you want to stay sharp. So you're also going to play 500. But the problem with 500 is that it just feels demotivating because you win nothing in comparison to 5k and you have one losing session at 5k you're just crushed for 10 buy-ins i mean one buy-in is 10 buy-ins and uh not going to make the money back at 500 plus at 500 you play against a completely different set of regulars than at, at 5k that have different skills and different weaknesses and so on so it, it's 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 uh moving up from mid to high stakes is uh it's a completely different deal. You play multiple different stakes. You play some of the best players in the world that are overall for the games. And you have a lot less volume and consistent action. So if you think about less volume and you play different stakes, the variance just goes completely through the roof, which nowadays for me, because I have other income streams, is not a huge deal. But if you're a solo poker player, it is a huge mess to having to wait for action and then just play like, a couple of hands of 5k or 10k lose ten thousand dollars and might not have you might not have action for another three days just waiting that is um it's very difficult to have make a living that way how did you deal with the the swings like as soon as you have a big range in stakes as you could say basically how well or bad you run at your high stakes kind of determines sort of your your year result how did you handle those swings a good question i mean i would say that by the point i was playing the regularly high stakes i already had enough of a successful business where the poker result wouldn't impact my ability to live my life to the fullest basically like it wouldn't impact my my net earnings enough to the point where it bothered me too much it was more that it what bothered me more is I would play in games that are generally good, but the problem is the opponents are so good because that's all they do. And they're just like, it's, it's a very predatory environment. So it's a, it's a killer environment in some ways. Obviously there's a whale and that makes it great, but you're playing against players that are trying really, really hard and are some of the best players in the world. And they're playing because that they're playing for a living and I'm playing because I can play and it's still a profitable game, but I'm working with smaller edges. So that in combination, what I'm trying to say is basically when you play poker and you're not sure you have an edge, that really can be bothersome because the whole identity that we have created around ourselves is that we have an edge. And you don't always know if you have an edge because that's not how the game works, but you, the game looks good, but there are other things to consider. You don't really know how hard your opponents are trying. You don't know exactly how good they are. And you also sometimes underestimate impacts like rake that come into play where the game looks good, but it might not be as good as it, as it, as it um, looks on the surface level. So there are a lot of things to consider when playing high stakes. And for me, monetarily, like it wasn't, that was not the big issue because I dealt with it otherwise with business, but more game selection wise it was difficult to decide what is a good game and what is not a good game or the right game for me yeah and especially uh especially when you take a shot you prefer to take a shot as a highest ev game possible right to to reduce the swings to a certain degree but yeah you're you're it's indeed always it's hard to estimate you also done or still do a lot of uh coaching Throughout your coaching experience, what is like the most common leaks that you find in the players that you coach and how do you go about fixing them? Most peop uh, leaks people have are from, from like professional nature. Like they're not really approaching poker like a business or like something that is super serious. So they're like leaking certain character traits that would help them to be more consistent. It's a lot more that than just like pure brain power. If you think about your ability like your mental cognition to problem solve that is dampened by your uh, uh, mental awareness right so there's a model by sam ovens where he talks about the billionaire's mind and the bottom of the engine which is your brain or your well your brain you can say he talks about mental awareness so like basically your ability to focus on something and if that ability is is um 
dampened by your lifestyle, poor lifestyle choices, for example, like you're spending too much time on social media, you're drinking, going out, you're just living generally like not like good life hygiene, so to speak, your mental cognition will only be running at 50%. And most people would have enough mental cognition, enough brain power to actually be good poker players. They are not in the mental state of awareness that is required to really take out 100% of that then they're going to operate at 50. There's not enough to like make it really work. So I think for most people, it's more about, about fixing anything that is a to uh, access their full mental cognition, which is just like all the distracting stuff that happens in the real world, like social media and distractions and going out and drinking and, and all this kind of stuff. Like if they would get rid of a lot of this stuff and get more clear on uh, what they really want out of life, then they they themselves would know how to get better at the game because getting better at the game nowadays is as easy as it ever was. So that's not really difficult. It's more about how much uh, how much uh, how much brain power is available to you to dedicate to that task on a daily basis. So I would sit together with people that are coaching and I would ask them more like, what is your day to day going to look like and what are you doing to active, actively become better? And oftentimes it wouldn't even have a database or they wouldn't even know how much big plan per hundred are paying in rake, or they wouldn't have rigid study habits that would allow them to build up a knowledge base to then execute on. So it's a lot more about these things than mm. strategic misunderstandings. But obviously, strategically speaking, I would say what most people struggle with in poker is they they think and believe that they are not good at game theory because it sounds so complicated. And when I read or tried to read mathematics of poker, which is something most people should not read, I didn't understand anything. And I was like, I'm bad at understanding game theory and math. Like I'm just like not built for this. But nowadays with solvers, you don't need to be good at any of that stuff. Like you can actually like game theory and understanding poker on a conceptual level is not that hard. You just have to like start watching some videos and looking at outputs like sims and you suddenly start realizing oh this all makes sense like it makes sense why this hand gets raised it is because we're attacking this part of our opponent's range like in terms of removal effects it makes a lot of sense so what's the big concept behind it well it's this this and this okay can i formulate it in a couple of words sure this is the concept i'm going to write it down so most people they don't really ever make the leap from um, copying what they see other people do to thinking conceptually about the game. What is the concept at hand here that I can extract and use in my game? How does it apply in this spot? How does it apply in that spot? They never really go there because I think, because they think they can't do it. And I guess also the terminology often used sounds too complicated, but I've heard the same concept being explained in a super easy way that everyone can understand. And I've heard the same concept get explained in a way that I'm like, Wait, wait, which concept are we talking about? Oh, you're talking about this concept, but I, you, you so much words that it sounded really, really smart, but now I had no more clue what you were actually talking about. Like, for example, actualization. I remember I was coaching a football player once, and then I said, yeah, but you have to do it. And he said, yeah, because you shouldn't let him make his hand. I'm like, yeah, indeed, you have to deny equity. Yes, yeah. indeed. <laughs> so yeah, you know, because if you don't bet big, yeah, he's going to make a stupid hand on the turn. I say, yeah, exactly. Equity denial, indeed. Yeah. You know? But he just refers in a way that's way, yeah, way more intuitive for a human uh, to understand. When it comes down to no limit, have you ever, probably you have, have you ever coached no limit hold'em players trying to switch to PLO? And what are actually common mistakes that no limit hold'em players make when they switch to PLO? It's a good question. I definitely had some like high stakes players that are trying to make the transition. Let's think about this. I would say PLO is a lot more equity driven as mentioned before. So it's more about assessing your absolute hand strength and understand, understand relatively like where it lays. So for example, I have top two pair. How strong is it right now? Is it extremely important and relevant and ever coming back question in PLO? PLO is a lot more about understanding how your hand strength matches up with the SBR and the action that you see. So top two pair, for example, can be of various strengths dependent on the SBR, the action you see, and the exact board cards that are out there. Where in, in Hold'em, top two pair is much more of a, of a static hand class, uh, like the absolute hand strength to relative hand strength terms just in, in comparison to PLO is much more static. So like you can make you can make more rules about 
flushes and straights and top pairs and two pairs and no limit. Where in PLO, it's much more dynamic where suddenly your top two pair is, is, a, is a bluff catcher or, or just like a trashy hand. So in the solver, for example, you would see things like, let's make an example the board is like 10, nine deuce with two diamonds and you're in the big blind and you have like a 10, nine with a meaningless side cards. It could be a hand like Jack, Jack, 10, nine. So you don't really have a straight draw or you don't have a flush draw. You might check raise the flop in a single raise pot. And if your opponent pots over the top and makes a flop three bet, you're going to fold your top two pair in that instance. And you were using it kind of as blockers by check raising. But once he puts all the money in at SPR 13, your hand becomes a fold. And that switch from making, from looking at your hand in the flop and thinking, I have top two pair, it's a great flop. To, and then you check raise even supporting that claim. And then the, you get shoved on and saying, actually, now it's a fold. That is like incomprehensible for most people in coming from no limit or just coming in, coming into PLO in general. But it is the easiest demonstration of the point that your absolute hand strength can change very quickly within the course of a hand um, based on the action you see in the SPR at hand. Yeah, so the equities are going to shift more often on a later street. So looking ahead and thinking about how strong my hand is going to be on multiple turns and rivers is more important. But then again, I... And it obviously depends on the SPR. I do have the feeling. No, yeah. Obviously, the deeper the SPR, the more important this becomes, and the shallower the SPR. Because I often sometimes I see a PLO and I'm like, okay, yeah, pots. Guy never folds a tree bet. Pots, pots, raise pots, <laughs> yeah. and all the money goes there. I'm like, what the fuck <laughs> did this happen? <laughs> then I see the heads, and I'm like, oh, these hands are not very strong. But I definitely feel like the SPR is a very like in Hold'em, it's already a big SPR. But I feel like especially in th in PLO, I see people stacking off. Shallow SPR is very light. And then deeper, yep. it's, I feel like the SPR impact in PLO is even more increased also by, by the reasons you just explained. Yeah, as the, the nuts and bolts of PLO is like SPR 1, 32% equity, SPR 2, 40%, SPR 3, 42.5, SPR 4, 40.4. Like those are just basic numbers you need to know to be like, oh, okay, SPR 4, I can pot call it off here because I need... Uh, well, without if your opponent pots into you at SPR four, you need forty four percent equity, and if you and, and against the stack off range, it's probably not going to fold. So you need to know my hand does have forty four plus percent equity to push it in here against my opponent's stack off range once he's potting. Like those are, you need to have the experience to understand how equities are going to look like and what equity is required at any given spot, and 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 that can be like learned relatively easily or with solvers, you can understand these thresholds kind of quick. But um, it's not as common to think about that equity shift all the time in no limit hold'em, where in no limit hold'em, you think more frequency based on, I have top pair, top kicker, so this hand is going to be a call down, right? Because I can beat all the bluffs, where in PLO, it's more like my equity was X on this street, on the next street, it was Y, which is completely different, and now my hand becomes an instant fold. It happened, that happens a lot more often in PLO. I think it does help from a, from example, from a mental, making mental game mistakes. It's very common in Hold'em that you kind of hook on a certain hand strike on the flop. Like you said, ah, I have top right of kicker. And then you don't take in consideration the future, or at least you take less in consideration the future exit that might change your opinion because you're already hooked. I think, I guess, naturally PLO players, they evaluate better their strength of their hand on every street because they have to, because the strength can change so, so rapidly. Exactly. Yeah. Making that shift is 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 a big difference there for sure. You also you also mentioned you nowadays play way more live in terms of mistakes that, for example, especially for example during the series, you see some online kids coming out to Vegas to play live poker. What are like some common mistakes you see online players make when they go play live? The biggest mistake is to bring their backpack and their own salad. <laughs> that's a, that's a, it brings, brings out the wrong image actually it was funny i was i was playing in vegas for the first time in many years this year and actually there was a girl and she also brought her own lunch and then there was a regular at the game and he also said and then she was gone and he said yeah well she brought her own lunch what did you expect uh, like how she was gonna play and then we were talking a bit about uh uh a bit about like uh like reads based on they say yeah you see this guy he, it looks like he just came out of uh, came out of bed. His hair is all wild. He's ready to blast. He says he's ready to blast. He's gonna blast this. You know how old are you? Twenty two. Twenty two year old kid just came out of bed. Rough hair. He's gonna blast. 
And then they looked at me and said, you, you know, if your hair is slick, you know, you dress nicely every day, you're way more calculated. You can blast as well, but it will be a calculated blast. And then uh, he was basically explaining like all the pros on the table. Very, very much enjoyed it. But yeah, don't yeah very yourself. much. If you play live poker, image is, is super important in uh, in many different ways. Like when I started playing, when I started playing in Vegas, like basically moving there kind of for the first time, there are a couple of things that I started implementing like the first one is i don't in if you're in the us and you play live poker i personally like i'm trying to fit in more so than be the european guy so even if i meet someone from switzerland i don't want to i don't want to talk in german or in my native language because that is being seen a lot more like unfriendly to the environment so I'm trying to fit a lot more in, speak English and understand their culture. So like they like, for example, um, American sports is a, is a big topic on the table. Who's betting on which game? Uh, you don't short stack. You uh, don't come with the backpack. Like you might even wear expensive clothing because it makes the game overall more casual, basically. So I understood the importance of playing deep, playing with a lot of chips, uh, wearing expensive clothing, not bringing a backpack, like all this stuff matters in order to make the game feel much more comfortable to the recreational player because it doesn't look like it's going to hurt you to lose a lot of money, which is good, which means that you're going to give more action and they're going to pay you off more often. And also they feel more like an e that you're an equal, that you're not there. Ha like you never want to give away the feeling that you need desperately to win at the poker game you want to give away the feeling that this is a fun game and we're all playing we're all gambling we're not talking about strategy we're not bringing the backpacks and we're not looking like we're saving money on anything like you tip good uh, to the dealers you tip well to the waiters and you talk sports and you play deep stacks and you straddle and also that's another thing is like when you straddle never ask the table if you want to straddle that's just the weakest thing ever you just straddle that's it and then either someone straddles as well or they don't. But these are like small things that the whole, the whole dynamic of the table will be influenced by, especially if you have authority. Like in my case, because you play PLO, a lot of people know me at the table. Like I'm not going to get rid of the coach's image. But what I do is I buy in deep. I, um, let's say I, I lost a couple of pots and we play a big one. I might say, I'm going to run it one time. I need to get unstuck. Like, I'm going to say that and do that because it makes the game more real. We're not playing like a computer mm -hmm. game. We're playing, we're gambling. I'm trying to get even. So we're gambling, we're running at once. Or I'm straddling under the gun, not asking the table, are we all doing a straddle? No, I'm straddling. Let's play. Well, you, should educate the, you should educate the average No Limit Hold'em game that I played there. Because no there's a lot of things <laughs> going wrong. Yeah. I mean, I was definitely guilty of the backpack. Uh, I did not bring my own lunch. Uh, so that... that <laughs> That's what I didn't do, but... Uh, yeah, it's well. very normal because when you are a tourist, then you obviously want to bring some stuff with you. But it's like small things like that can really help you to just not only get paid off, but in my case, for example, I usually play... The game that I play in Vegas is a one-table game. So it's only there's only one table that runs that game. And if the, if the game breaks, then there's no game for anyone to play. So it's either this game or no game. So you want to make sure the game keeps running and the game keeps running if the recreation players have fun. And the way they have fun is by you not short stacking, by you gambling, by you talking, by you being active. And, you know, and there are like small things you can do. For example, um, things I started implementing is uh, that I saw another guy doing a rec is doing this a lot. Like he's standing up a lot in the hand. And even though it's, when you hear about it, it sounds kind of annoying. But if you think about someone that is kind of nervous and is trying to gamble, like you, you might stand up, you know, like on the flop, I might stand up and I'm like, I'm all in, I'm all in, you know, and you do that. And then what, what is, what it creates is like, it creates more fun and action, you know, like this guy's all in, he's standing up, he's ready to gamble. Like, what are we doing once or twice or three times? Let's only run two times to count the bottom board or whatever it is. Like it is, you're trying to basically create a cool environment to have fun in and, uh, and if you do that, you the game runs longer, the recreational stay longer, they have more fun, they come back. And also you might uh, 
you might get more action in several spots. Like I got soft play in many spots or I got paid off in many spots where it is more the small things you do that add up to a picture in their head that then that makes them believe, oh, this guy's tilting or he's about to bring it in with something light or whatever it is. And they're going to end up paying you off. It all comes together. And also at the end of the day, it's a lot more fun. So what I would pe recommend people doing is number one, speak the language and only the language that is spoken at that poker room, if you can, right? If it, obviously if you can't, you can't. Try to fit in, try to make the game as fun as possible. Don't short stack, table select, table move, seat move, like all these kind of things, generally trying to avoid them and, uh, and be communicative. And if you, if, you, if you do these things, you not only get more action in general, but you might get a couple of numbers. You might do pre-organized games. You know, every, people are like complaining every, everything is privatizing, but the market is what the market is. And if the games are private, then you only have two options. Either you're going to fit in or you don't. Adapt or die. So, we, yeah. we, we come back again, right? Yeah. So you have to you have to up your, you have to be a player. You have to play in a way and behave in a way that people like to play with you. If you want to get invite, invited into games that like if everything becomes private, you need to find a way to be in there, right? Exactly. And th there were several instances in Vegas, like this one guy, for example, was like, uh, who wants to flip? I just lost 5k. I'm like, let's flip. You know, I mean, it's anyway, even neutral, who cares? Just, and, and if you're if you're that guy that is not afraid of just like, if, because you're not desperately looking for the min cash and then leave. That's good. Like you're good for the game. And so wow, but that, like, I, I was in generally surprised about like a lot of the guys who play way more live than me. For example, if there's, I would always chat with, especially with the recreational players, is, because like you know, the often the table would be quite dead. People would put headphones in and stuff. And I'm like, well, yeah, but, ah, guys, this is like I intuitively <laughs> understand that this is not what this guy is gonna like to do. So I I have a chat. Hey, sir, where are you from? Uh, but I'm like, wait, I'm the online kid. Why why am I doing this job? You know, I I didn't get it. Like it it comes quite natural to me because I'm also I'm also I was also there professional slash recreation because i was also there to have fun right i'm not going to be there and sit with my headphones that was not my 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 idea of the trip uh i did feel bad i, I stacked the guy twice in a row and i was the only one chatting with him so i was kind of befriending him then i stacked him twice and it's really weird like life it's it's, it's a bit weird especially if you cool it i cooled the guy twice he had to leave grab more money and then like an orbit later i cooled him again and he had to leave the, the only recreation at the table and i was the only one befriending him so i felt really awkward and also he looked at me in a way like it's like okay i, I prefer online in this in this matter so i don't see what happens after i took someone's money so it's a bit awkward it's something that uh yeah that it's interesting because the dynamic is uh like the dynamic i have with rex is very different sometimes to uh, recreational players like with i might hard play like some recs like super hard in certain spots where i choose like the most uncomfortable line or the, the most uncomfortable spot it might be that i might run it once against the guy that is like uncomfortable with the money because he's a pro and i'm like sending a message of like you know there's a price to pay to pay here uh, to play here and uh, the price of the pro or like if he's an uncommunicative pro or playing short, obviously I'm running always one time because it's like, guy, like you're not doing anything for the game. You're playing short. Who gives a shit? Like, uh, we so don't need you people, in this because game. Because I never you know? understood. Why do people not, not like in my, in my, in my online head, it's like, wait, why would you not run it twice? Give me one good reason, but I've heard many good reasons. What, well, one of them is short stacks kill the game. So you want to run it one time. Another one is it just makes like if, Poker players look at gambling as the ultimate enemy. And that's a big mistake. Gambling is a big part of poker. And if you can embrace a couple of spots of gambling here and there, it's much, much better, not only for your image at the table, but for your psyche about how to approach the game. If you think gambling is a huge enemy, then variance is also a huge enemy to you. But if you are okay with gambling sometimes, and you're like, you know what, today we're going to gamble and let's see what happens, then you are a little bit freed up from this I'm signing up to a nine to five job. I need my hourly paid up at the end of the day. Hopefully I'm not going to be off deviation. Like if you can free up yourself from that and say today, we're going to gamble some poker. Then you fit in into the life, into the life scene a lot better because recreational players, that's how they think. They're like, today we're gambling. I want to have a big win. Let's see what happens. And sometimes you get it in and you're like, I want to run it one fucking time. 
because I'm trying to win a 20k pot. Let's go. And then the recreation is going to be like, damn, this guy's this guy's here. He can't gamble. He can't came to gamble. And then and then he's like, ah, this is guys like me. We're gambling here. You know, that's what we're doing. So that that's much more healthy for the game than. You know, trying to do like let's do the even variance thing or whatever yeah, it is. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely need to, if if I if I want to play more life, I definitely need to up my gamble because on one side, for example, when when the things are normal, aka they look like online poker, I'm in my comfort zone, right? I know exactly what's going on. But the more side games, the more straddles, the more shit goes on, the more I get pushed outside, the more the game gets gambly. And on one side, I like it. I like the side games. It naturally, you know, triggers my curiosity. I'm also here to play live. I'm also here to have fun. But I do, I'm not, a, I'm definitely not a, much of a gambler myself. So there's like some resistance that like, on one side, I like it. On the other side, I don't like it because I kind of lose control over what's going on at the table. Whereas if we just keep the table normal, I know exactly what, what to do. I know I'm in perfectly in my comfort zone. But, you know, with, with experience, for example, stand-up game, I love it. Uh, yeah. it's, it's 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 so much do they do it in plo or no as they well? don't do it in plo when i heard about stand-up game the only thing that conflicts me about it is that it is so easy to collude in a stand-up game so that's the only thing to pay attention to if you play a stand-up game with a lot of racks especially in no limit where you can force people out of the pot easily mm. the, that's the only thing i would be like the ev of cheating in head in stand-up games like cheating life is difficult but not if you play a stand-up game because you can just let people win hands in certain spots by like you, you know, three bet them, they four bet you, they fold, you win the pot or whatever it is. And suddenly you're, uh, I think that's maybe one of the reasons why some people have to show now their hand when they want to win. The yeah, you have game. to always show. That was the, there was the reason. Every hand you show, you have to, but I mean, it doesn't say anything. Let's say I four bet yeah. someone and I show complete trash. Everyone just go oh. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, stand up game, stand up yeah, game. Yeah, but like it was maybe they, your body. Pre, pre-agreed like, hey, yeah. Uh, so basically, yeah. you have to be careful when you're with like friends who are all regs that something like My that. My players are sharp. Like if player, like poker players that play live, they spend hours and hours and hours just sitting there waiting for hands, and they think about things. So they're pretty sharp on things that online players don't necessarily think about that much. Oh, hundred so, percent. I mean, right. So I would be just generally aware. Of, okay, like this is a live game, so stuff happens here that I'm not used to, and these guys probably. And that's why I'm all about adapting and I'm trying to understand what's the the, the people that have stood the test of times of playing live poker, like how do they behave? What do they do? They probably have good reasons for doing whatever they are doing and trying to understand where they are, where they are coming from, especially the successful, reputable ones. All right, good advice. Adam, you much of a gambler? I'm not actually, even though I do like the kind of thrill of things being out of control in certain avenues. But in terms of like going for gambling opportunities, I am very... Uh, much aversive to them in terms of I don't really seek them out. I don't really get much pleasure from them. For example, if I went to the casino with my friends, I wouldn't really get much pleasure from playing blackjack, playing any gambling games, whereas my friends would be loving it at the end of the time of their lives. Um, but in those get kind of dynamics, the way Fernando explained that game, I would definitely be comfortable getting involved in the gambling for the game dynamics. I'm more of like a, a people pleaser. So if the, the group dynamics demanded me to be a gambler to fit into that environment, I think I would become the gambler just to, 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 to blend in. But in general, I wouldn't naturally uh, be a gambler from my, from my own accord. So yeah, yeah I have totally. exactly the same. I, I'm not one to suggest extra straddle side games, but I'm never the one who says no to anything. I will always say yes to everything. I'm just a pure pleaser because I'm like, I'm not going to be that guy who says, sometimes you have a guy who's like, no, sorry, I don't straddle. It's like, okay, then can then just get out of the table, you know? It's like, this is... <laughs> but some guys actually, some guys were actually nice. They said, no, I don't straddle. Oh, so this game is going to be straddled. Okay, then I'm out. They voluntarily decide to live. But sometimes I'm also like, let the guy not straddle. If he doesn't want to straddle, who cares? The rest straddles, let's go. But yeah, some people had different different opinions on that. I was yeah, always was against again. gambling, you know, because gambling has this, because if you're every poker player, once it becomes his profession, sort of tries to grab onto that, to this identity that we are making calculated bets and that the enemy is gambling also, not only because we're making calculated bets and we're trying to convince other people that poker is a, is a serious thing, but also because we know as poker players that the gambling games in the casinos are a trap to addiction and a trap to uh you know b- bad way a bad way uh, of losing your money in your life so we naturally are averse to gambling and i was like all the time 
But now spending more time in Vegas, I understand also that there are big advantages of embracing certain elements of gambling because it is part of that culture and poker and gambling are intertwined. And at the end of the day, the reason we play poker is because it is a gambling game for the recreational player. So they want to gamble and they want to see other people gamble and not just wait on the sidelines to, um, they don't want you to always be the casino, if that makes sense. Like you always play with the edge and they don't, I mean, they're not stupid. Um, but they also want to see sometimes you, you know, giving action and you give action in different ways that could involve gambling that might even be neutral EV, but they're perceived as you are seeking gambling action like they are. It makes you more relatable and it, it, it spices things up. And I think once you get more used to that, the swings that come naturally through playing feel less intense overall because you're more at peace with variance given the gambling aspect that is now newly introduced into your life game. And also you, you understand the long-term EV. So the short-term swing because you were gambling is, is more easily justified, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like as well how the context of gambling has been, uh, it's in the context of playing poker here. We're not talking about being reckless and betting your house on some random coin flip. But I think what generally gets the connotation with gambling is you're losing EV. You're it's making a negative play. If I think of gambling, I'm going to the casino, I lose to the house, I'm gambling on something else. It's generally like a reckless kind of side to it in terms of how you can interpret it. But the way you're explaining gambling, it's more embracing the gambling side of poker, which is a big part of it, and playing to the strengths of that in these, especially live dynamics, to create a better atmosphere, a longer term EV. And it's a different type of gambling. So it's like a gamble with a payoff, where a lot of like payoff in terms of equity in the future, but also uh, the game dynamics, where in general, but my connotation when I think of gambling, I think um, almost like either break even or generally losing. I'm just taking a risk for no real reason, long term. There's a long term EV of a gamble. But in these dynamics, I really like the how you're almost thinking long term of where the gambling's leading to, which is great. All right, I want to finish on one question for me. Or one question. I want to finish on a Denzel Washington quote you mentioned in your questionnaire we sent to you. You said, "Don't just aspire to make a living; aspire to make a difference." I want to know uh, why that's important to you and how poker has fulfilled this value for you as you've gone through your career. Yeah, poker can be very like solo pursuit where you basically are just trying to please yourself while trying to mess up other players because it's a competition at the end of the day. And that's what competition is all about. It's beating other people. And I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with it. I mean, competition is life. And even if you're in business or wherever you are in the dating world, competition is a real thing. It's a survival of the fittest. And I think it's healthy for humans to interact in that. But also as you get older, most people will realize that, hey, maybe I want to also give something back or influence some people, leave something behind, provide more value. And I think that's extremely fulfilling because I think in your 20s, as we discussed in the early stages, it's more about finding this identity and self-confidence by doing something you're proud of in a pursuit of improving yourself. So you look more inwardsly in order to find something you're proud of. And as you grow older, you look more outwardly in order to achieve the same thing. So you becoming stronger, faster, smarter is going to start giving you less appreciation and satisfaction. And it's more about what can I do for others that uh, naturally humans as they progress through life and you get closer to the end of your life you start thinking a lot more about so i think it's just an it's just a change in priorities most people probably experience that with with when they start raising a family and have a child they're like well now my own priorities are like me improving my life becomes less important than this child's life and then on a different from a different angle it would be other people whether with uh, making a business like running a business like in my case running the business is something that is extremely fulfilling because you are helping each other basically to have great lives and careers and you connect with each other in a mutual way like not in the pursuit of battling each other and that's i think very healthy if you think about if you think about uh, what's a good life for most people I think rolling it all the way back to more ancient times is a good blueprint for that. It's a lot about community and coming together as often as possible. So when we talk about lifestyle design in 2023, I think if you can replicate that to a certain degree, you will find a lot more happy people. So how can you live a life where you are together more often with peers and friends and spend more time 
with them instead of pursuing your own thing relentlessly. And I think that's also a form of giving back. It's just like building a community with your friends and achieving something together. And uh, I've been doing this on a business level by by uh, building this company, but also on a personal level, I'm today living a much more interconnected life where I'm traveling with friends to different destinations and stops. I'm seeing them more often. We do more things together in person than I used to. And uh, that has definitely given me much more life quality, uh, but it was a some, I mean, it was a pretty conscious lifestyle design decision. It is not just like happening randomly. Mm. Yeah, very inspiring. So what would you recommend or give advice to somebody who's maybe stuck in the uh, aspiring to make a living model? They're trying to make ends meet and they'd love to uh, have some breathing space to give back, but they're kind of in their own narrative and they're hustling and grinding. From my own experience, I've almost felt like you you need to win that game to some degree. You need to create some breathing room, some space. And then once you get to a certain point, you realize, ah, my own intrinsic needs of trying to seek my own goals. Yes, I can still go for stuff, but I also am in a position now with knowledge, with wisdom, with time, with energy to give back to others. So um, if someone is stuck in the kind of acquiring to make a living, like many, many people are listening to this, any advice you would give to those to uh, maybe uh, push through that patch and, and get to the kind of more given uh, difference? Well, the easiest way to make a living is to actually help others because that's how you create value and you get compensated for that. Obviously in the poker sense, doesn't necessarily work that way because it's a competition. You're like an athlete, but outside of poker, that's basically how it works. If you think about how do I, how do I want to get compensated? Well, the answer to that to this question is depends on how much value you can provide for other people. So if, if, if you now exchange the idea of money with uh, something like energy or feedback or appreciation, it works the same way. If you want to feel more energized or more appreciated, then just do something for someone else. And although I, I do agree that there is a certain level of things you have to have achieved yourself in order to fully or dedicate more time to other people. You can always help someone else, even on a small scale on a daily basis. And it's actually one of the easiest methods to get out of your head is to do something for someone else versus over obsessing about your own misery that you perceive to be so bad. And it's easier to just say, Oh, I'm, how can I do something for someone else? And then once you do that, you're like, Oh, what was my problem? Again, I actually forgot. And then you just move on. And, uh, and beyond that, so I think helping others can always happen. However, if you become more successful yourself, you just have more leverage over helping other people. So if you have more financial possibilities, for example, or you have a big business that you're running, you can help more people at the same time, which is also great. And like if you are 20 and you have no money, you can't really raise a family and provide for a child so you can't help that child really that much as if you're older and you have more money and more time maybe possibilities and i, I would say in the same way that's also true for uh for helping people in general in my case like the way i kind of look at it is if i look at my friends group i have some of my best friends are 15 years older than me and some of my best friends are like 10 years younger than me so I think there's a ton of value in spending a ton of time with people that are in at a different parts of their journey in their life than you. You can gain wisdom from people that are older. Like the way they talk to you is more like in a, an advisory way. They have more wisdom for you to share. They are, they are more patient overall. And if you talk to younger people, you can do the same thing for them. So the easiest way to help other people and reach back is to just work with younger people. And by working, I mean, maybe there might be in your friends group. Like it's, it's refreshing to have people that are different age groups in your friend circle. Mm. I also think it doesn't always have to be with your kind of ideas and knowledge. Often you can make a big difference in people's lives by being a good role model, by leading by example, by being the person that people turn to and say, oh, they're the person that can do those things or they follow through and stuff. They've got good character traits. And like you said, it doesn't have to always be on a big scale. Very often you'll make a big difference to those people you spend time with in your proximity. And you've always got interactions with people where you can make a difference to someone else's life in a small way. I think often when we hear like the grandiose terms of make a difference, we think like on a big scale in the world or change in society. In reality, it's these micro moments, these kind of interconnections with people where you have a, an opportunity to listen to somebody sometimes just listening to somebody their problems and really trying to understand them is a way to make a difference so yeah i think sometimes we uh, can just make small differences in lots of little places and 
that fits into the the overall trend, ultra theme of trying to make a difference overall. All right, so I'm very respectful of your time, Fernando. So I want to ask the final uh, question, which is often Rene's question. So sorry, Rene, for stealing it. Uh, but what would be the main <laughs> takeaway you'd like to the audience to take away from today's conversation that you've had with us today? Oh, I enjoyed it very much. I thought like we're we're going to talk uh, about a lot of turn river play, but uh, it, it ended up being turn river life play, which is nice. I always appreciate these conversations and I appreciate that uh, to find people that enjoy and can hold these kinds of conversations because when I think back about my biggest aha moments, it is from podcasts like that where I can zoom out and realize, oh, I haven't thought about it that way or this way on a, on a much bigger scale. And that shifts my direction and shifts my perspective into something much more meaningful after getting such input. I would say like my, my main takeaway, I would say from this conversation is that all of us in this call, we came up in poker a long time ago and we bring that knowledge, but also these biases with us into today's poker market. And today's poker market and climate is very different. And if someone wants to be successful at poker nowadays, which I wouldn't say is necessarily a bad idea, there's definitely great possibilities within it, then they need to be very adaptive to the current environment, which is now much more challenging and competitive than it ever used to be. And and approaching that from a more sort of like smart, broader lens approach versus uh, I'm going to work hard and be successful approach is way more important today than 10 years ago, where 10, 15 years ago, if you just worked really hard on your poker game, you can jump into any game at any side at any moment, and you will be successful and you will have success for the next five to 10 years. And I would say nowadays is a little bit different. Today, the opportunities in poker are there. You can make money. They might come in different forms. Maybe you have to play live. Maybe you have to move locations because the websites that you want to play online are blocked in your country. Maybe the taxes in your country are shitty. So therefore, you shouldn't play poker there. Maybe you want to have a side income as a vlogger, as an ambassador, as a streamer. Maybe you want to be an affiliate. Maybe you want to launch a podcast and have a new skill set that you start acquiring to then venture out into a different business model for example like all these things especially with today's modern technology inter interconnectedness online are things that the modern poker player should consider in order to enrich their career and also inject longevity because if you're blindly steering towards the poker dream from 10 years ago you're probably gonna have some sort of bad wake-up call in a couple of years from now and don't know where to go. And that's when people usually talk about being stuck in poker. And that's very avoidable nowadays. Just have to be smart about it. And hopefully this conversation like, helped some people to consider that. I think it definitely will. What I love about speaking with you is I always get new perspectives that get you think outside the box and think more long-term strategically more yeah holistically and so to speak so yeah i really thank you for spending three hours with us today to share all your insights i know myself and Rene will definitely recap on what we've learned from you as well today because we like to uh inst and get our own nuggets of knowledge from the guests as well so yeah thank you very much for the time i was passing over to Rene. any got any, any follow up questions for yourself Rene, to wrap things no, up no 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 you uh you wrapped it up perfectly <laughs> all right thank you Mr. fernando thank you guys too thank you a lot fernando great wisdom as always Adam, curious, what are your main takeaways from today's episode? Yeah, it was a very interesting conversation. I think perspectives was one of the main ones I've learned from it. My cat's just coming in to spoil the show. <laughs> and yeah, I think one of the main things was how zoomed out and holistic he talks about poker and his choices in poker. So I... Uh, one of the main ones was looking at poker as a business and treating the poker options in terms of game selection, games you're going to play as almost like avenues you can explore in the marketplace. And before you start optimizing your kind of game that you want to play, uh, be very uh, careful with selecting which avenues are going to get you the results you want. And I really like to talk about a kind of building systems to achieve your goals going forward. And then a really big part of this was how to execute the system. So we talked a lot about basically deciding the goal you want and picking the game you want to play, then design the system in terms of the planner, and then being the executor. You went really deep on how to uh, overcome emotions, how to stay, take actions in alignment with your goals long-term. I think when you really balance all these kind of things together, if you like really think hard on these things, you can get a very um, zoomed out perspective of where you're going and then a very action-oriented 
uh, step-by-step process of achieving your goals and how to actually move forward on a day-by-day basis. So uh, myself, I'm definitely going to listen back to this. It was a long episode of uh, widening perspectives, but I really thought his advice on this kind of bigger perspective was really, really powerful. I also liked what he talked about is in trying to do stuff that makes you feel proud. I know for myself, I definitely, uh, more and more so in my, my, my life going forward, I align my goals more with things I know I'll feel proud, fulfilled at the end of. And this often means doing things that are effortful and often challenging in order to get a reward long-term. And I think himself, he mentioned like, rather than being happy in the moment, often happiness doesn't necessarily correlate with our best actions or our goals. And yeah, maybe going for all, what will make me proud in the future could be a better model. So I think that's something for aspiring players who are on the journey of figuring out where they're going We're very useful. And yeah, I think Fernando's got a lot of really interesting ideas applying business to poker. And yeah, really, really helpful for myself. And I think anyone listening to this will, will get a lot looking back. How about yourself? What are the main takeaways for you? Yeah, he made a lot of... Uh, every question that we made, he turned holistic straight away. I think it's a great quality. And I think he really showed that a lot of his experience throughout uh, poker and everything that he learned and then later also developed or applied into other areas, you can see how much things we can actually learn uh, yeah, throughout our poker career, right? This has been coming back in other podcasts as well, but I've definitely thought it was pointed out here. Um, some other things that I wanted to point out, we didn't actually talk that much technical stuff in this episode, but I did point out a couple, uh, how to behave at the live poker tables. I remember in the, it was the podcast thing with Joe Viral, uh, where he also touched on this, right? The recreational is there to gamble, recreational is there to have fun, and we have to provide the fun for him. He gave a lot of good tips. I was definitely guilty of bringing my backpack. I did not bring my own lunch. So <laughs> at least I, I gave that box. But indeed, adding some more, more gamble and not thinking only in terms of EV, very important lessons there. We talked a lot about conceptualizing, right? When he would study solvers and when he would approach a game. This is also what he said, like in live poker, because... It's less, uh, the situation are less static. I have to conceptualize the knowledge and pu- kind of puzzle solve on the fly. So conceptualizing knowledge in when using solvers or when studying data, finding like reasons behind why the data shows a certain number is very important. It's definitely very in line with our coaching philosophy as well. He also talked about action reaction in a solver. Like, oh, we act in a certain way because we expect a certain reaction or react in a certain way we because we expect our opponent to take certain actions. Uh, and the last one I wrote down when I asked him about uh, mistakes that players often make, he again turned it very realistic. He said, yeah, usually people make mistakes because they're only performing at half the capacity of their brain, which is due to life choices that they make outside of the table, which then influence how they perform at the table. And if you reflect on it, a lot of the mistakes you will make at the tables when going through hands, maybe at least half of them, or at least have talked for me personally, are mistakes that could have been prevented. It's like, oh yeah, I, I actually knew this, but it didn't come out. So maybe I could optimize some things that I can perform at a higher level. Maybe the other half are actually technical mistakes where I'm like, oh, this is just knowledge that I didn't know. But it's way more common that you make a mistake that you actually in hindsight kind of know what the correct play is. So it's more mental games slash performance related. Great. Great pot. Very happy with how it turned out. I hope you guys liked it as well. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I want to thank my co-host Adam. I want to thank again Fernando. Leave your main takeaways and comments about the pot down below. We will pick the best main takeaway or a random main takeaway and they can win a free month of GTO Wizard. Shout out to our sponsor of the pot. Thank you guys for tuning in and I will see you at the next episode.